right, and we are back on the Pizza Podcast. Today we got an um, real special guest. We got Stephen Bloom. He was going to say amazing, so I don't know why he stopped. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Stephen Bloom is freaking amazing. So Stephen is from, uh, he is the owner of Allied Bake, which is an equipment company mainly specializing in uh, bakery equipment, ovens, um, oil therm ovens. I saw you speak on the... Uh, Bread Symposium that Peter Reinhardt did, uh -huh. and uh, I know we had a chance to talk on the phone a few times and your wealth of knowledge, so uh, yeah, man, thanks for coming on. It's great to have you here, buddy. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So uh, let's, wh who is Steven Bloom? What is Allied Bake? What do you do? How'd you, uh, how'd you get a spot on the Bread Symposium? That's a pretty big honor. Tell yeah, well, the way it started was... Um, I was living in San Francisco. I was playing drums. I was um, collecting unemployment. Um, and a social friend, basically, um, who had been in the bakery equipment business, needed somebody to help him start up the little office that he wanted to you know, restart, get himself back into the business. Okay. He was willing to pay me under the table while I collected unemployment and you know, was willing to let me come in late you know, if I had a late gig with my band. So, okay, you know, why not, right? <laughs> um, but I was, let's see, when did this start? I was in my early 30s already. Okay. And at a certain point, it started getting interesting. Um, I started traveling to Italy because we started dealing with some Italian suppliers. And, you know, you can't really tell your band, sorry, I can't do this gig because I'm going to be in Italy. Right. You know, so... After a certain number of bands broke up and, you know, I thought to myself, okay, do I want to, you know, this is, wasn't really literally the case, but um, metaphorically, do I want to live on the floor with, uh, you know, on a mattress for the next 10 years while I see if I can make it as a rock star or should I pursue this? So I pursued it and one thing led to another and about 20 years later that I accepted that it was my career because um, it didn't fit my image of myself. <laughs> and uh, eventually um, I found out that I had absorbed a lot of knowledge after nearly 40 years in that business. So um, I've gotten to work with like a lot of the top artisan bakers in the country. Uh, and I've early on, I developed a niche in, and this just, again, it all happened by accident, but um, I, st I started traveling to Italy. I started seeing what European bakeries were like and how they ran. And I saw that they were at least 20 years ahead of American bakeries in terms of the way they produced things, the way they thought about things. And so I started uh, trying to bring some of that equipment and some of that point of view uh, to U.S. bakers. And in the process, I... I brought some very innovative machinery that people had never heard of and had never thought of using. And one day, one of my customers who was had a bakery called Bavarian Specialty Foods uh, in Los Angeles, and he was supplying pastries to airlines and that, that kind of level of production. Right. He, had, he was using rotating rack ovens. Which is very, very common, in, you know, in yeah, the mi middle-sized bakeries, and he had a bank of about thirteen or fourteen of them, and you can imagine how many racks were floating around the floor all the time. And he said, "I can't stand all this anymore, but I have too much variety to um, to try and use a ton oven because that's you know one thing, and if you want to change over from one, one product to the next." It's going to take time. You have to change the temperature. You have to create a gap. It takes up too much space. But I've heard that there's such a thing as a multi-deck tunnel oven. So at the when you go to the EBA show in Hamburg, you know, next month, be on the lookout for that for me because I can't go because I have to go to Hawaii for a sales call. Mm. Okay. So I'm walking around the show in Hamburg, and I all of a sudden see what looks like at least the front part of a multi-deck oven. That Wow, okay. So I go in to talk to the people. Well, they didn't really 
take me seriously. Right. You know, this this American kid isn't going to know what we're about or understand us at all. You know, they had a pretty superior attitude. Um, but somehow the owner of the company heard the conversation and he spoke enough English and he said, come. So he took me into his little office at the show, sat me down and proceeded to tell me what this was all about. And I came out of there an acolyte. I, I, you know, I came out of there having gone through a little epiphany because I understood that I was, I thought I was looking for a multi-deck oven, but what I found was a completely different kind of baking technology that I'd never heard of before that incidentally made possible a good multi-deck tunnel oven. Mm. Uh, and that technology was thermal oil baking. Thermal, yeah. And so then it was a matter of who's going to be the guinea pig in the United States who's willing to, you know, take this on. And I spent a couple of years, you know, both learning about it and trying to find that person. And I found two clients at the same time, one of which was La Brea Bakery, which okay. was at the time a 1,000 square foot adjunct to Campanile Restaurant. Right. And um, Nancy Silverton was baking on a little three-deck Electrodolin deck oven. Dolin? Yeah. Oh, really? And um, so I started talking to them about this technology and about what it would do. And she didn't want to go to Germany to take a look at it herself for whatever reasons. But she sent, so she sent her husband, Mark Peel, who was the chef at the restaurant. And he just made her promise, if I come back and say this is the, you know, really the thing, then you have to go for it. You can't send me over there and then not follow my advice. So she said, okay. And she asked him to look for the evenness of the bake. And she asked him to look for the um, quality of the crust. And she asked him to look at the steaming. And he came back and said, you know, this is what you need. Then I had to figure out how to sell it to her father because he was the one who was going to pay for it. Right. Uh, and so he says to me, my daughter already makes the best bread in Los Angeles in this little $20,000 electric deck oven. Why do I need to spend a quarter of a million dollars on you know this oven system? And I, it didn't take me long. I had to think quickly on my feet. <laughs> and I said, because your daughter can make the best bread in Los Angeles on that little oven, but unless you want her... In the bakery, 24 hours a day for the rest of her life, you have to buy my oven. Right. And he did. And um, sort of the, the, so rest, the rest is history. <laughs> I heard, well, so my understanding of oil therm ovens is that they're, they're pretty large, right? Like the smaller. Yeah, you don't. It's too expensive a technology to make small ovens. Right, right, right. So they are. So how'd she fit it at 1,000 square feet? Was uh, that enough? No, she was about, the, the whole reason for this was she was about to open a 10,000 oh. square foot wholesale facility for the first oh. time. Oh. And I was supplying all of the equipment for that. Got it, got it, um, got it. Yeah, and, now But in right terms side. of ovens, you know, what everyone knew at the time, the, the artisan bakers mostly knew of steam tube ovens. Right. And that was pretty much the, the best you could get in terms of the quality of the bake. And as I explained in the talk that you heard, it's all about thermal mass, and it's all about um, the, what the, the Germans call delta T, the, the difference in temperature between the source, uh, the, the heat transfer medium, which in a cyclothermic oven is air, which is in a steam tube oven is steam, and which in a thermal oil oven is thermal oil. Okay. And each of those media has a different thermal mass or a different energy content okay uh, and thermal oil holds about 2600 times the amount of energy in a cubic centimeter as air does air is actually an insulator right. so it's completely an inefficient way of bringing heat to the baking chamber now what about um electric it would be like on the actual element is yeah it's uh, electric is a radiation but in in typical industrial ovens like a, when I say air, the air is, is heated in some sort of heat exchanger section by the burner and then piped into radiators, which radiate the heat. I mean, mo most of these ovens, industrial ovens, are based on a radiant heat. 
Yeah. Okay. But it's what's in the radiator, what's radiating the heat, what's bringing the heat to the radiator that I'm talking about. Got it. So if air is bringing it, you have to heat the air up way, way higher than the baking chamber temperature you want because it doesn't hold a lot of energy. And as soon as the product is there to pull out the energy, you, ha- you have to replenish it. And, and so maybe if you want to bake it, you know, 450 degrees, you have to heat the air to 580 in order to get 480 degrees. And then once you, you know, load in and low out, you're capturing a lot of that. So is that where, like, this flash heat thing comes so in? Flash, I'm trying to, yeah, flash, trying to understand yeah, this. Flash heat comes in in the fact that when there's no product to absorb that 580 degrees, you're going to get 580 degrees. Mm-hmm. So that's why in a typical industrial tunnel oven, for example, traditionally you would not start out by sending your product through. You'd start out, the first few rows would be big pans of water to absorb that extra heat so that the front products didn't burn. Okay. Because the front products otherwise would be exposed not to 450, but to 580, Hmm. right? Because that would be, you know, flashing off of that surface that had nothing to absorb that extra heat. Right. Well, to an extent, that's true just in between your products as well. Okay. So if you have a bunch of products sitting on your belt, that space between them, however small it is, is still doesn't have anything to absorb that extra heat or radiation. So what you end up with is extra heat around your product. And that dries out the product. It sets the crust too soon. So you can't get as much oven spring. So you don't get as much volume. And also because it dries out the crust, it causes the moisture inside the product to wick out to the outside and you, and you dry out your product and you don't get as long a shelf life. So there are a whole lot of reasons why the less flash heat, the less that delta T is, the difference in temperature between the heat source and the actual bake chamber temperature you want, the less that is, in a sense, the better your product is going to be. Right. And that's why a steam tube oven is better than a cyclothermic oven, because steam is a better conductor of heat than air is, uh-huh. but it's nowhere near as good as thermal oil. Right. But would it, is, it, is there any, like, correlate? Like, so on a thermal oil oven, um, I thought in my head, because it's, it's it, see if we could pull up thermal oil ovens, like, see if we could get a picture of, like, the inside of one, because I always thought in my I head. should have brought pictures. Um, yeah, no, 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 we'll pull it up. Okay. But, um. I always thought in my head that it's like it was just instead of like, you know, like a steam tube oven, it would just like oil running through the pipes. But you told me that's not the case. Is well, they're, it more, not, they're not pipes. They're, they're not radi- pipes. They're radiators. They're radiators. Like They're horizontal radiators. They're very thin. Okay. The oil runs through them in a serpentine fashion. You can't see it, though. No. You can't see that it's like enclosed in yeah, there. It's a closed system. So now are those are those radiators like is there like enough of them like to you know create thermal mass or is all the thermal mass the thermal, just coming from the, the, the th- thermal heat? mass is in the oil itself. It's in the oil itself. And that's one of the beauties of uh, these kinds of ovens is that when you open the door, for example, you're not really losing any any heat because or any, you know, you don't have to, you don't lose the temperature and then you have to raise the temperature a lot because it's not the air that's really containing all that thermal mass it's the oil got it got it got it so and that does that help a lot with recovery as well yeah i mean the the way i like to describe the bake of a thermal oil oven is that it bakes like an old brick oven mm. and the old brick oven is the oven that has such a mass of heat once you heat it up I mean, it takes a while. you got to get that brick hot, but it holds the heat, right? So now when you put your product in, temperature doesn't drop. Mm. You put your product into a cyclothermic oven or into a rack oven, say, temperature just... So so you have to compensate by... You you end up with these curves that are like this as you constantly fire up the, the burner again, and the burner creates heat. First of all, there's a delay. So you sense let's take a rack oven okay it's it's a you're heating up air you're blowing the air into the uh chamber so you have convection Mm -hmm. uh, basically but 
whatever your bake temperature is, as the thermostat starts to see that it's dropping, it sends a message to the burner. Now the burner, because of all the safety factors in burners, it has to go through a whole self-checking process, it takes, I don't know, 40 seconds to a minute or something, and then it starts up again. And then it'll heat the air, and now it's got to heat it way up higher than the baking temperature you want to compensate for that drop that you have. And then when you get back to the temperature you want, then the product is absorbing you know, more heat, and you have this constant up and down, up and down. And every time you fire up the burner and you get the air really too hot, you're drying out the product even more. Right. So your bake time is longer. You're drying out the product more. I mean, there, it's just one, <laughs> one injury after another that you're doing to the product. Right. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. Is there? Is there? I mean, is there any products? So just, just to finish. So yeah. The thermal oil, because it holds the heat, and the the heat is always available in the primary circuit. What happens is you have the the heat to the temperature that's typically about, well, it depends on the manufacturer. The one that I represent um, has the lowest delta T of all of them. And it has the, it, you, it sends the oil through the fastest. So what happens is, as you start to lose a degree or so, the valve just opens a little bit and you get in just the right amount of new hot oil at the right temperature to, to get that right back up to the temperature. So your variations are like this instead of like this. Now, you brought up um, a buddy of yours who had a bunch of different products that had 13 rack ovens earlier. Did yeah. he end up switching to an oil therm? No. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. That had nothing to do with it. Uh, <laughs> that was just how I got into it. So do the oil therms, do they also, can they change temperatures for, yes. oh, they can. Of course. For because individual all, decks. Because all, all you do, well, that's a matter of how you, okay, so here's here's a rack oven, but it's not a rotating rack oven. What happens is, if you, can, if you can look at this, if, maybe there's a picture somewhere of the door open, but you see, the, look, oh, sorry. Yeah, you see here there's a radiator and a deck surface. A radiator and a deck surface. Okay. okay. That deck surface in this particular oven is actually created by a stone trolley because you can bake on a stone in these ovens or you can bake on a rack in, in, on pans. What happens is here's the radiators, right? They're all cantilevered, as you can see, and they take up. You can't walk into that oven; it's filled with, you know, these radiators. Right. The rack comes in, and slides right in between. So now every level of the rack is sitting right above a radiator, and it's getting heat from below and, and above. Mm. Instead of the rack, which is you're going to need to carry pans if you want to bake on pans, you can pull those racks out. And you roll in this stone trolley, which sits in the oven, and now it is literally a deck oven. Really? Because this is just exactly the profile of a deck oven. You have your deck, your stone deck. You have the radiator below it heating the stone, and you have the radiator above it. Huh. Now, with this type of oven, the temperature in all these radiators is going to be the same. But you can have different temperatures in different ovens, because each one is on yeah, its own. Yeah, bring this mic over with yeah. you when you point it. Yeah. <laughs> you can do like this. <laughs> you, have, you have different um, different ovens next to each other. Each one is on its own secondary circuit. So what happens is you have the primary circuit brings the oil at, say, I don't know, 500 degrees, right? Okay. So your baking chamber temperature is going to be about 480, 485. Okay. Right? Um Each oven, though, has its own circuit, which has a mixing valve, a pump, and a thermostat. Okay. Right? So when the thermostat detects that the temperature is getting a little bit below what you want, that mixing valve opens up, and you bring in new oil to supplement the oil that has been cooled by the product. Right. right. So you're constantly adjusting the temperature to always have the exact temperature you want in that group of radiators, which in this case is an oven. But in a, a in some sort of multi-deck oven, <laughs> um, 
you you could have a group of radiators representing one deck of the oven. Okay. And a different set of radiators representing another deck. Or you could have a group of radiators representing just the bottom heat and a separate one representing the top heat. So you could have separate top and bottom heat control. Or you could have different sets representing the first third of the oven and a different set the second third of the oven and a different set third third of the oven so you can have temperature zones throughout the oven in like a tunnel yeah. like type of thing yeah. so that would be a tunnel oven that it would just go all the way through yeah okay so you have you have tremendous flexibility in how you build these ovens based on what's the purpose what's the what what's the kind of baking profile you're going to need how much flexibility do you need but you change temperatures by mixing new oil from the primary circuit, which is always at the highest temperature that you want it to be, with oil that's recirculating in that circuit that's cooled by the product. If you want to lower the temperature, you just don't add any new hot oil. Okay. If you want to add temperature, you add new hot oil. Got it. So it's very flexible. Now, I'm imagining like a giant oil barrel, like sitting somewhere behind these ovens like what so yeah. <laughs> that's just what i'm imagining okay. in my head what so, does that look like okay that it's it's called a heat exchanger okay and um it, it it does sit pretty much anywhere preferably in a machine room somewhere away from the production floor okay and that you and you have a burner that either they're two stuck they're vertical ones and horizontal ones but either way the burner burns down into the heat exchanger and into the center of a coil through which the oil flows. So that heats the oil. That oil is then pumped over to the oven, which can be 100 feet away if you want. Right. The advantage of that is you're, you, you only have one burner. You don't have a burner for every rack oven, for example. Right. You can feed different, or, or, you, or you, ha you don't have different burners for different lengths in the tunnel oven different stations in the tunnel oven. You just have one burner, but you can have different secondary circuits controlling the heat in the different sections or different ovens that you want. So you only have one burner, and that burner is not on the production floor. Right. So that means you don't get flour dust in the burner, mm. which means you have so many fewer problems with the burner. Issues like maintenance issues and yeah, everything. You don't have to. Yeah. And the heat and the noise of the burner is not on the production floor. No. So the only heat coming off these ovens, because they're well insulated, really is the heat of the product when you when it exits the oven, the heat coming off the product. Right. But other than that, you're not contributing to heat in the bakery. Okay. What Now, if somebody, how many, but you wouldn't just buy one of these, or would you? Well, yeah. I, you, could, <laughs> you could start with one. Um, yeah. um, it's... Uh, it's not impossible to buy one. It's I've never a, even seen this. This is my yeah, first time. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't know there was a therm rack, therm yeah. oil uh, yeah. rack oven. This it, is pretty it, amazing. It's not. It's not that you couldn't buy, wouldn't buy one. It's that you would only buy one if you had a lot of money, right? Because um, one of them means not only the oven but the heat exchanger. So it's a quite an expense. Now that same heat exchanger, maybe you'd buy one that could handle four ovens. Okay. So you buy the heat exchanger and one oven. And then every time you add an oven, you don't have to buy another heat exchanger. Yeah, so the price comes so down. So the price per oven of the heat exchanger portion becomes amortized better. Right. But there's still there, there's no question they're expensive ovens. Yeah. On the other well, hand, they're the most energy efficient ovens. They're about 87% efficient in terms of their use of energy. Okay. And uh, I have had clients who got rebates from either utility companies or from government agencies for putting in more energy efficient equipment. And, the, okay, the price of energy in the United States is pretty low compared to the rest of the world. Right. Compared to in, Europe especially. In, in Europe, the energy savings on these ovens literally pays for the oven. I actually know uh, a guy years ago who, you know, he was, you know, born in Italy, came out to Brooklyn, opened up, you know, a New York pizzeria or whatever, came, went into it with his family. Eventually, he moved back to Italy, and he was like, I want to do this in Italy because they really don't have this in Italy. So he he loaded up a couple, like, Baker Pride ovens onto a, you know, a ship or whatever and shipped them over there and had to throw them out in a month because his his gas bills were, like, 6,000 euros <laughs> a month because it was just like they, 
you know, if you've ever used like a, a you know, an American pizza oven, it's there's no insulation in it. It just shits out gas. Yes. Um, there's no there's no even attempt. They're like 1940s cars. There's just no no attempt whatsoever to you know save energy or you know what I mean, not be a gas guzzler. Yeah, and that's part of what I meant when I said that I discovered early on that Europe was way ahead of the United States in a lot of respects with with bakery production. One is the energy consciousness the green consciousness another is simply the fact that it's very difficult if you hire somebody over there to ever get rid of them if even if they're doing a terrible job right um and so they're very cautious about hiring people so they'll spend all kinds of money to automate a, something that can be automated really and as a result i mean i'll never forget the first bakery that I went into. This was a probably 1985 or 1986. And I was, um, I was seeing a bakery that was going to represent two pieces of equipment that I was interested in, in selling to people in the U.S. One was a paper cup dispenser for muffin cups, you know, to oh. put the muffin cups into the pan. Um, and then it drops the goes down the line and it'll drop the batter. Yeah, and and then there's the batter deposit, and then there was also the, this particular kind of uh, double planetary mixer that mixed closed. And anyway, I walked into this bakery. It's a whoa, def- whoa, whoa, back up. Double planetary mixer. Yeah, wh- what? one thing at a time. Okay, okay, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so I walk into this bakery. It's a medium to low medium size wholesale bakery by U.S. standards, okay? Okay. They're making nothing but their equivalent of muffins, cupcakes, muffins, whatever. There were two people that I saw working, and they were the two women who were sitting at the very end of the line putting the fully individually wrapped muffins into the box that they were going to ship out in. That was it. It was a it was a racetrack, essentially an oval. Right. The mixer was you had automated feeding of ingredients into the mixer. It would mix, it would discharge automatically, pump itself over to the hopper of the depositor. The pans would go under the paper cup machine, paper cups would go into the muffin cups, then it would go to the depositor, the depositor would deposit, it would go around through the tunnel oven, come out the other end, cool. Muffins would be depanned automatically with a system that picked them up with suction and took them all out of the muffin cups. Pans would go back to the paper cup depositor, et cetera, et cetera. And those um, muffins would then go to the flow wrap machine, which would wrap them individually. And then they went to the you know women who... Little you know, old ladies. Put, right, exactly. Own. That same operation in the U.S. at that time, and maybe today, would be 50 people. Right. Because... We aren't used to spending that kind of money on automated equipment, but they were. Right. And that's kind of what set my whole career uh, on a path. We we I actually have um I have a good friend uh, Domenico Tolomeo. He's been on the podcast before. He's the guy behind Zazzy's Pizza, and his father owns a um um it's. You know, like, uh, it's a wholesale baking operation. Mm-hmm. Like, you can't walk in there and buy bread. They have, like, it's not the biggest tunnel oven you've ever seen, but it's a tunnel oven. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, kind of more or less an automated system. You know, they still have employees and stuff like that. But they were telling me that, like, you know, when they bought this thing, I believe they were saying, like, it was, like, in the 90s at some point. Like, nobody really had ever heard of this stuff, like, in the U.S. Or they were saying, like, it was, like, one of the first from Italy I don't even know. Like, when did like tunnel ovens really start coming well, into no, it's like? Not that tunnel ovens didn't exist. It's just that only huge, huge bakeries, Nabisco's, and people like right. that would use. So them. it was like Wonder Bread had them, but like the little guy, yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's just something that the mentality to spend capital on machinery like that only existed at the highest levels of the industry. Right. That's all. Because it's got to be, yeah, it's millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. yeah. And um, and labor here still, compared to Europe, is cheap. It's not as cheap as it used to be. Yeah. And it's also getting really hard now for people to find people. Every bakery that I visit is complaining that they can't find people anymore. Yeah. 
yeah, it's definitely it's a problem in the restaurant business all around. Um, I think it's um, I mean, I've been real, reading a lot of articles on it, and I I kind of see it where you know, it, I don't think it's like there's not people out there. I think like people are just done like with low wage work, like I think a lot that's of people. Exactly right. You know I think what I that's mean? Exactly right. I think people when COVID put them at home, they had time to think about. Is this really how I want to spend my life doing all that stuff? I'm enjoying being at home. I'm enjoying seeing my family. I'm enjoying right. whatever. You know, maybe maybe it's not worth. I mean, we, people before just thought this is what I have to do, and now they've had a chance to reassess. Yeah, and a lot right. of people make career shifts yeah. during you know, especially in the hospitality industry, where it's like, hey, let me go on the computer and see what's out there. I mean, who uh, wants to stand there and take muffins out of a tray? No, for no one. Four hours. No, no one wants to do that. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. but yet, there was this period of time when the companies didn't want to invest in the machine to do it for them. Sure. And, you know, there's the, you know, sentimental thing of like, oh, you're firing workers. Well, find something else more productive for them to do that the machines can't do. Train them. Yeah. Well, I think there's always going to be, I mean, I would say like, you know, do something you're you're passionate about. If you're really passionate about bread, like, um, or or that industry in general, like your job shouldn't be picking up muffins. It should be. (laughs) You know, maybe trying to create the best muffin on the planet to exactly. serve to a community or something like that. Like, right. and that's where, and I think there's always going to be um, a lot of room for that. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm starting now, there's all these pizza robots coming up, but like, you're never going to like, you, you maybe you can replace like the pizzerias that, you know, they're not all that great. Nobody really is going nuts over them or this and that. But there's, I, I think there's always going to be, you know, a chef, a pizza place, uh, an artisanal baker in a community that's going to be, you know, an yeah. anchor of that community. And yeah, then... and it's important. I mean, I'm one of those people that has the kind of philosophy that, you know, the the love and the passion you put into the food is is a significant part of the nutrition that you get from it. Yeah. Um, we don't eat just the physical food. We eat the spirit. Um I mean, if I go into a restaurant and I hear the 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 chef, you know, yelling at the cooks, I'll leave. Right. Yeah. That's not the food I want to eat. Right. So, um, for sure, there's always room for that, you know, entrepreneurial, you know, uh, express your passion, whatever. But the drudgery jobs, we should let the robots do them. Yeah, let the robots do the drudgery. I completely agree with that. Like, there's no. I was in a. Um, frozen pizza factory in upstate new york recently and it was just kind of like like i was just like imagining like i'd never seen anything like that and you know it's all these lines and tunnel ovens and different things going on and i was just like why would you want to like this is like working at a factory this isn't like working with food this is yeah you know it's a very very different thing they are factories they i mean yeah they are i mean you gotta you gotta wear hair nuts and yeah. you know put on lab coats and that's my life. um <laughs> yeah you gotta I put the, to factories. what do they call what do they call those the things you put on your shoes the booties, the, the booties. Yeah. i love those things you've um have you did he? Is it? Am I? I'm not, I don't know if I'm getting this right. Did Brett alone get a thermoil oven? Yeah. Yeah, that was that was with you, right? Yeah. Tell me about those guys because I've I've heard different things. I don't know if I got it right. Like I heard they were using like, like some kind of old brick ovens at one yeah. point. Yeah. They started. They started out um, as, I mean Dan <laughs> Dan Leader who um, started the the bakery um, was on. There were several people back in the early 80s who essentially you could consider the the progenitors of the artisan bread movement in the United States. Right, yeah, and new Dan, world d- artisan d- bread, yeah, and, type of and, thing. And Dan Leader was one of them. He was the one on the East Coast. On the West Coast, it was Steve Sullivan of Acme okay. um, who got his start by being— you know, by working at Chez Panisse, and they needed good bread, and they couldn't find it, so he started to bake it and sell it to the bakery, and one thing led to another, and he started Acme. And, in fact, uh, Steve Sullivan was kind of Nancy Silverton's um, idol when she started La Brea Bakery. Hmm. So so Dan Leader was one of the, the first. And, you know, he, he started... A, a lot of these people, Chad also, Chad Robertson, um, started with... 
kind of homemade brick ovens and you know wood fired ovens and anything yeah. as artisan you, as you can get. Right. But as you get bigger, you have to find something that's a little bit more practical, and yet you don't want to compromise your product. And that's exactly where thermal oil fits in because it gives you the product of the old brick oven, but in a way that can be industrialized essentially. Um, so, so but, well, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Your, I'm sorry. Your, your question was about um, bread alone. So anyway, so Dan Leader started it, and he started it in in Boyceville, New York, which is up in the Catskills. Yeah. And um, over the years, I would keep talking to him because he kept on being interested in you know getting better and better equipment, but there really wasn't a place for it in in the Boyceville location. And eventually, it got to the point where he was ready to expand, and I actually helped him find a, a larger building that he could build a production facility in in Lake Katrine, New York, which is just north of Kingston. And we put in there a 12-deck uh, thermal oil deck oven, which obviously is fed by an automated loader because you can't reach all the way up there. It's like right. 17 feet high. Um, it has about 60 square meters of baking surface. Jesus So Christ. that's about, you know, 650 square feet of baking surface. That's um, yeah, e each deck is five square meters. Uh, right. There's 12 of them. That's... But now what he's done, what actually is his son, Nels, now is the um, CEO of the company. Dan is officially retired, although he's still somewhat involved. But... Um, they decided to rebuild <coughs> the Boyceville facility, excuse me, which still had um, the old brick ovens. Okay. And they pretty much rebuilt it from the ground up. Um, and in there, they put in a couple of those um, thermal oil rack ovens, um, which they'll use for products, both both deck type products and, and other kinds of products. but. Um, and in fact, one of the beauties of thermal oil uh, ovens like that is the steam system, because you're running in, in a typical rack oven, you have steel, and you spray water on the steel, and that creates steam, but then it takes a long time to reheat that steel. Right. Whereas here, if you have thermal oil running through it, you keep that power, you can keep on steaming like a lot. And so um, we built him an extra couple of thermal oil steam generators to send oil to, to send steam over to his brick ovens. Oh. Um, but anyway, the point, the special thing there is that most typically people will fire the heat exchangers with a gas burner. Mm -hmm. And typically, electrical energy is uh, more expensive here than than gas. But what he's done is he's you can you can heat the oil with any kind of burner you want. You can heat it with an electric burner. You're just heating oil, right? Right. So he bought a heat exchanger that's electrically powered, but the electricity is coming off solar panels on the roof and in the field next to him. No, that's so a, he's yeah, building that's great. A, a net zero bakery. Yeah. Well, so did he start off? Was he always like a wholesale bakery, or did he used to have like a you know a customer retail element to it? And yeah, no, they're well, they they have cafes. Uh, I think there's four, and that Boyceful location was the first one. So okay. They were always selling retail there, but you know they they also so they started off. It was like a bakery. You walk in, you get a coffee, you get your bread, right. maybe right. you know a tartine or whatever. And they then got. they started selling um, to farmers markets. Okay, and they still do a fair amount of business with farmers markets, but it's expanded beyond farmers markets. But yeah, I mean, you see, you go into any supermarket <laughs> I mean, and you see bread and loaf these to, days. You go to the Whole Foods on Fourteenth Street and. It's hard to find anything that isn't bread alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 100%. So the brick oven that they had, was it like a l very large brick oven? Like, I, I mean, I don't remember because we were very talking about beginning because I wasn't paying attention to them at the very beginning. But there, it's a pretty big oven. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. we were talking about Chad, um, he got his start on a wood oven, right. but it was it was a toy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it was. Yeah. 
no. I think he was able to fit like maybe six, eight loaves at a time. You know what I mean? And yeah. it was it was almost built like a Neapolitan oven. Like it wasn't, right. you know, when you see these old bread ovens, they're either like flat ceiling or vaulted ceiling, but they're very much like a rectangle and you know very large it's like well, a different again the, the the vaulted ceiling is to to radiate the heat to the to the stone on the on the bottom yeah yeah uh, yeah and focus it basically i mean i in in the talk that i did um for the uh, bread symposium bread symposium i started out and i never actually made the connection for people because i wasn't supposed to um it was supposed to be an advertisement, so I didn't want to mention the names of companies. Right. But um, the um, I talked a lot about the town of Bell in Germany, okay. which is where bakery. There were fifty bakery oven builders in that little tiny town at one point, because. Go ahead. Because right by there is this big lake called um, uh, Maria Lox, and. It, you, it was an old extinct volcano, that, and this was the crater, and now it's a lake, okay? But when that volcano erupted, it erupted, there were two kinds of, of stone, the, you know, the lava and the, the flow off of that volcano, and one type was a type that turned out to be absolutely perfect for the stone for bakery ovens. Um, because See, I asked you about the stone and. I knew it was you that talked about it. Yeah, go ahead. All right, let's get so, this. So, so, so all these oven builders, you know, started ma making ovens with this stone. They were all these same type of ovens where you'd have a little section where you'd burn uh, wood and heat the oven up. But, right. But it was a stone that had um, a lot of, you know, ability to transmit the the heat, and so. Now, this what company, kind of stone is this? It's What's called, it called? It's called Tuff, T-U-F-F. T-U-F-F stone. Yeah. yeah. Jesus, and, I was and, looking for this forever. Yeah, I was and it's, losing and, my mind. And it's interesting because when you – I don't know if there's a, another word in English for it, but that, like every time I see – like I, I also had a second career for a while importing wine okay. from Italy. And when you talk about the type of soil – You'll read tefacious uh, rock or something, tefacious soil. And it's like, what's the English of this? But I've never found it. So it's tough stone. Tough um, stone. Yeah. And you can buy this stone or no? I don't know where you can uh, buy it. Uh, yeah. But it's gonna like it's gonna require like a trip to like Bell Germany and like yeah. with a translator where yeah. you're like, hey, we're looking for this stone. They used yeah, to make I brick ovens about it like two hundred years yeah, ago. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's the only Oh wait, whoa, 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 go up, go up. What was that? Etruscan tough block. Look at that. Yeah, there you Etruscan go. Etruscan tough blocks from tomb at Bandi. Yeah, I don't know how to say that. Banditaccia. Banditaccia. Taccia, right? Yeah, something like that. Banditaccia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's. I mean, you, it's not that it only exists in Bell, but um, sure. But there was this volcano there, and there was a lot of that stone there, and so the the company that I um, sell thermal oil. Ovens for now, Hoift, has been there for hundreds of years. I mean, this is an eighth generation company. They can really? they think they may be. They're definitely the oldest oven builder, uh, bakery oven builder in Europe, and they might be the oldest bakery oven builder in the world. So I heard that. So they've so they've baked they've made every type of oven possible. That I was just gonna get to yeah. that. Like yeah, because I've I've seen you know all those all the. You know, I mean, there's a million of them, like all those Italian companies near uh, Verona. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. There's uh, like seven of them or well, something I'll like that. Why? Uh, well, well, yeah, this is what I read that uh, the originally the steam tube technology was invented in Germany. And then, you know, I'm sure you know the history better, but I heard it was invented in Germany. And then somebody, you know, it's yeah, pretty like, close like, by. Uh, before they made thermal oil ovens. These companies were making steam tube ovens because, sure. again, they were trying to get as close as possible to the bake of the original stone or brick ovens. Yeah. Because, you know, you would talk to the old timers in the area and they would say, you know, we used to get a loaf of bread. It used, we used to be able to eat it for a week. And now it only lasts for 
you know, three days or something. Yeah. And how come? Well, it's become because of the moisture loss from the drying out of the extra flash heat and all these other factors. And also the fact of replacing sourdough with commercial yeast, mm -hmm. all, all kinds of reasons. Um, but, yeah, um, you can th that stone exists in other places. But the, these, these companies have made every type of oven and have ended up... Um, Hoyft now makes only thermal oil because they believe in it. And that's pretty, that's kind of like the newest technology as far as like oven technology, more or less, right? Yeah, I would say. It yeah. was, what is it, like the 60s or? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it started, it, it was, it was developed in the 60s. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, it makes sense. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, how do you come up with this stuff? But now you got like a few well, generations. Th th thermal, thermal oil technology as a, heat transfer system existed before it was used in bakeries. Right. And so it was just somebody had the idea to apply that technology to bakery ovens. And that that was Thomas Hoyft's great-grandfather or whatever, and also simultaneously another uh, family that was based in Bell that then moved out to Hamburg, which was uh, Franz Daub. Uh, and Franz Daub was my mentor. He was the one who took me into the little room at the Eba show in Hamburg and taught me what thermal oil was all about. Um, and, you know, there are reasons. I stopped basically representing him when he sold his company, and it wasn't a family company anymore, and they didn't treat their customers the way I wanted my customers treated. Wait, um, so Bell's a different... Hello? Uh, <laughs> Bell's a different what? <laughs> Bell's a different company. The other company's called Bell? No, the, no, no the other company was Daub. D -A -U -E. Oh, Daub, Daub, yeah. Daub. And they moved to Hamburg and, you know. Yeah, they, they got they're sold they're out. The ones yeah. I, they're the ones I, I found first. Um, but those two families basically developed that technology first before others um, started to take it out. And Franz Daub told me the first year that he had thermal oil ovens out in the market <laughs> price, these weren't big ovens. These were, you know, small deck ovens, basically. He said, I had 25 ovens out there. I had 25 nightmares. Mm. Why because, was that? He's, because he said, the, the secrets to thermal oil are not in the books. You have to learn them by trial and error, essentially. I just... Um, and so you have to figure it out. You, you learn, you make your mistakes, you figure out the solution and by now they're pretty good at it you know? yeah yeah <laughs> what is it uh 80 years later or no 50, 60 years fifth, later fifth, 50 yeah 50 60, 60 years, years later, later. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 2022 yeah. so um yeah i mean i think it's i think i mean i think all the you know the oven technology i think the fact that one of the things that i see that's missing in like the american market we keep on like comparing like europe to america but when you look at the um the companies that took over like for pizza of it's frank mastro who's like kind of like this mythical nikola tesla figure <laughs> um of the pizza industry uh, that really nobody had ever heard about until quite recently um and there there's there's been a few diehard people who knew about him since back in the day but this guy um invented like you know, the pizza oven that brought pizza to America, you know, the deck oven you see in all the New York pizzerias. He invented the um, the the dough retarder. He invented the the pizza can. Um, he even invented, yeah, that's him right there. So he hooked up with um, with Blodgett, made this uh -huh. model pizza oven. Um, he turned uh, a shop at 240 Bowery where they actually still produce ovens and fridges, but under the name Bowery. Um, he had a fully operational pizzeria so guys could come in uh -huh. and like because everybody used coal fire pizza uh, before that. So they were like, oh, you can't like do this with a gas. Yeah, that was his story right there. Frank Mastro mm -hmm. right in the middle. Model pizzeria. Yeah, yeah, model pizzeria. And, you know, this is where everything came out of. But, um, uh, you know, it's a it's a very sad. It's kind of like a sad, you know, Tesla like story where, um, you know, he invented all this. He, he ended up doing franchising. He ended up financing like the first 800 um, immigrants after the second diaspora to open up their own pizzerias, uh, personally financed because they really couldn't go to banks. Um, 
and uh, he died really young, uh, and then his son took over uh, Vincent. His son passed away a few years later, really young, after doing the Queen's World Fair, and then somebody broke in, and people broke into the place, burned all the paperwork, all the royalty agreements, everything like that. It was a very shady situation. Oh and the companies um, that are around today, so Blodgett, um, he was connected to Blodgett because when he you know, came up with this oven, he needed the actual, they were making some other type of ovens and this and that. He walked up to them and he's like, hey, I, I need to make this pizza oven and I need thermostatic controls and you know, the gas burners and whatever. And they were like, what the hell is pizza? And he's like, <laughs> not important. Uh, I just need this stuff. And, you know, after years and years, he finally made a deal with them. But then uh, Baker Pride, which is, you know, a giant company now, I believe Baker Pride was one of his, you know, assistants who started that company. Um, Marcel and Sons, another big player in that type of oven world. Um, so he was at 240. They were at 98, and uh, I believe they used to make, like, radiators or something. But, you know, you're on the same block. Like, you kind of figure it out. And these guys were, you know, they were really doing it. But, um, like, they've made incremental improvements. But, like, talking about, like, from something that was invented, like, in 1937, like, these things, like, they still run, like, a 1940s Buick. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's been like uh, there's certain models of Marcel where they've added, um, you know, they've lined the top with fire brick and the sides with fire brick to create, more, you know, more, more thermal, thermal mass. mass yeah. um, other than that, you know, just nothing, nothing in the form of it. So like, if anything, like it gets like cheaper, like, you know, you you feel the door from, uh, you know, a 30 year old 40 year old model and you feel one on a new model and it's just like yeah it's it's I mean, that that's everywhere i mean that's yeah. why people in new york want to buy pre-war uh, co-ops rather than you know <laughs> oh 100 percent. but it doesn't seem to be 100 percent that way in europe at least not 100 uh, percent yet i mean maybe they're going to go down that path um as you know because they are getting americanized i'm seeing like 20 years ago or not 20 years ago but yeah now, 15 years ago when I was in Italy, like, I mean, I was like, y people were like thumbing their nose at McDonald's and all this stuff. And now I open up my Facebook and I see friends who are accomplished, like top chefs, top in their field, proudly like taking a selfie in their car with a bag of McDonald's on the way to work. And they're like, you know, proud of it. Yeah, I started traveling to Italy regularly in the mid 80s and it has changed a lot. For it, it's yeah, it was I remember reading this story years ago, years and years ago, where it was um, I think it was, it was a town in Abruzzo that was famous for some type of, um, you know, type of focaccia type of bread that would you know, be filled up and made into sandwiches and this and that. And a McDonald's had opened and it was like this, this guy decided to open up one of these focaccia like next door. And it was this real David and Goliath thing. And the, the McDonald's ended up shutting down, you know what I mean? Because the town kind of band together and decided not to, mm -hmm. you know, go after it. But, um, I don't think those stories are happening anymore. Uh, it's become, and now you're, you're seeing, I see so many guys there, you know, burger shops are opening up all over the place and just anything American. I brought out, um, what I, I want, isn't it crazy? Yeah. When <laughs> I won, uh, when I won chopped, I called, uh, Antimo Caputo from Caputo flower. And I was like, I want this guy, this guy, and this guy flown out to my party so that they can make pizza. There were guys that, you know, do this Kanoto style pizza, which is like the new Neapolitan thing going on. Um, and they came out and I was like, hey, you guys want to, you know, we'll go to uh, go out to dinner. You know what I mean? We'll go uh, we'll go to Emilio's. We'll go to, uh, you know, this place, that place, you know, whatever. And they were like, no, no, no. Danny's. I said, what? Danny's? I said, what What do you mean? I said, <gasps> Danny, like the, the 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 chain. And they're like, yeah, Nino, Danny's. I'm like. You don't want to go to Danny's. I'll bring you to like a proper diner. They're like, no, 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 Danny's, Danny's, Danny's. And they fucking ate everything. They're like looking at everything, like how the toast is made and how the pancakes and how it's like done on the thing. And then you see them like, you know, and then when they go back, I'm like on Facebook and a week later, they're like in Italy, like trying to recreate it. Um, 
And like part of it's kind of amazing because you'll see them, you know, like there's these shops that they're doing. I don't know. Have you ever heard of the you're a San Francisco guy? You probably don't know about this. There's this thing in Jersey called the grease trucks. You ever hear of this? Yeah. I am a New Yorker, but it's uh yeah, yeah, I yeah. I lived in San Francisco for a while. Oh, okay. I grew up in Manhattan. So. Oh, you grew up in Manhattan? Well But I still don't know about Grease Trucks. Right across the bridge, <laughs> uh down down the Jersey way, there's um yeah, there used to be these trucks at Rutgers University and they made this thing called they were called the Grease Trucks and they made these sandwiches called the Fat Sandwiches. And it was like the fat knight, the fat bitch, the fat Philip, the fat this, that. And what the general thing that they had in common, so the fat the fat uh, night, which was like one of the most popular ones, was um, uh, cheesesteak, chicken fingers, um, mozzarella sticks, French fries, and then they would write on the menu mozzarella sticks twice, uh, and then like lettuce, tomato, onion, and this and that. So it was like, yeah, you you would go get when you were wasted, and if you go to New Brunswick and get wasted, it was like a really enjoyable uh-huh. thing. Uh-huh. Um, Anyway, I see these guys making like it almost feels like a version of that, but like with like really good ingredients. Like instead of like the, um, I mean, it might not be. It's it's still probably not like the greatest thing for you health wise. <laughs> but like not. instead of like processed uh, like cheese whiz or whatever, like you know processed American cheese or whatever they were using, um, you know these guys are making like a bechamel out of like a buffalo or or a, or, a, or a nice provolone or a prova. You know what I mean? And they're making like this bechamel that's going in and that that's getting dripped over the sandwiches. And instead of French fries, they'll put, um, you know, like really, really crispy potatoes that they do on a griddle. And it's like, you know, the hamburger with the broccoli rub with the bechamel and then a big burrata on it. And like that's like their burger. Mm-hmm. And then they'll do different things with sandwiches. So it is the one thing interesting about it like as sad as like the changes and hopefully it gets stopped in its tracks at some point but what's interesting is seeing what these guys do like trying to recreate these american you know kind of dishes yeah no there's definitely a, any everywhere in the world at least for the longest time it's been anything american has its own niche as fashion right yeah yeah. No, it's. Uh, I mean, look, it took it took Italy to make Timberland fam- uh, famous, for example. Really, yeah. I did not know that. Oh yeah, when I mean, did they, that happen? Uh, well, back when I was, you know, traveling there in the '80s and stuff like that, Timberland was the big thing. Everyone was buying Timberland. Really? Yeah, and then all of a sudden, people here started waking up. Yeah. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Over and over and over it happens. Over and over again. All right. On that note, we're going to take a quick break, but we will be right back. Where we at? fluently and they immediately start speaking really fast and you, you get lost and, <laughs> gets all sorry yeah you have a very soothing voice steven but you have like a, a radio voice like yeah better than mine <laughs> i got like a uh i don't know what my voice is it's all fucked up but um all right we back? back okay we are back so uh you you also you you sold Chad Ro- Chad Robertson one oil therm uh, yeah. semi. We're gonna recently. have to get you in the habit of calling them thermal oil. Thermal oil, thermal oil, thermal oil, thermal oil. oil. Thermal oil. Thermal oil. All right, got it. So, yeah, how did that come about? Because I know. So the way that <laughs> in his first book, I just want to say, yeah, in his first book, he actually talked about, and that was been written many many years ago. But he talked about the fact that. Um, uh, you know, switch it from wood fired to I believe it was an electric oven in the original location. It was remember. a it was a multi deck electric oven. It was I don't know what brand it was, but um, it was you know a steam injected multi deck electric, pretty large oven. Um, not super large, but but he explains in the book where he was just like, listen, heat is heat. Um, 
and blah 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 blah. And I've I've heard people kind of like reiterate that to me like later on, and you know it had an effect on me. And I think it was an important thing to point out because there's too many people out there that just think like, oh, if you use wood, uh, like that's somehow affecting the flavor, or things like that. And it's, I mean, it's not it's not true because there's just not enough time for the. You know, yeah, when you're smoking absorb, something, right. that's one thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a different thing. You're actually cooking with the smoke, um, but when you're, you know, when you're cooking something for in in pizza, like two to ten minutes, or in bread, twenty five to forty minutes, um, there's just not enough time to, you know, really. Yeah, I mean, the whole that. history of wood fired ovens is just the fact that that was how you got the oven hot that was a fuel yeah yeah you didn't That's it. yeah I mean, you either had you, coal you, or you, you had burn, wood you you burned the 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 wood in the oven until the oven was hot enough and with that stone and or brick or whatever that would hold the heat then you would put the bread in right and, and, and you would pull the wood out yeah yeah well, you, yeah you unless you had an indirect right. right yeah heat like right. yeah I've, I've seen ovens where it's like you know these old hundred year old new york bakery 40 feet deep coal ovens where you know the the coals are you know completely separate they're not on the oven chamber they're mm -hmm. like in a separate space like kind of like heating up that oven in a separate way and then you know they heat up they're still hot but they're not really you know what i'm saying affecting it it's not like in a neapolitan pizza oven where the wood's right here and the product's right here it's like yeah the coals are over there and this thing is you know this massive but again as i said the the whole shape of the neapolitan pizza oven is so that that heat gets radiated down into the center and uh, onto the stone so mm. yeah that and, makes sense the bread yeah. is yeah it's like it's uh it's do well but bread ovens aren't well neapolitan pizza ovens are like a beehive shape mm -hmm. so they're like kind of you're mm -hmm. saying like they're really concentrating um, the concentrating it in yeah, Dan uh Dan uh Richard, Richard. from uh Raza, he was on the show and he was talking about how he um had Forza Forney custom make his, you know, pizza oven to jack up the thermal mass. So they they what they essentially did was they threw like they do um you know, this kind of like refractory concrete, whatever it's made out of some special formula. And they make two halves of it, and he had them put like an extra, you know, basically two ovens in one, like mm -hmm. so that all. And he was telling us that like the oven only, like on a normal, any kind of like a Kunto, Pabesi, uh, Maraforni, whatever kind of uh, wood fired oven you're using, at the end of the night the fire goes out, you close it, you walk in the next day, maybe it's 200, 250 degrees, you know. His is 600 degrees when he walks in. You know, it only yeah, loses I mean, that, about 100 actually, degrees. That's actually a feature of thermal oil ovens, too, is that they just don't lose their heat very fast. Right. Um, but um, I remembered something I w wanted to go back to. Yeah. Um, early on, you were talking about all the oven makers in Verona. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was going to tell you why that is. Yeah. Um, this is something I found, I discovered when I was... Uh, started working with Italian companies. What happens is these companies start out as family companies, right? And they develop, you know, if they're successful, they you know, they they develop something really interesting that, you know, is sells well and they hire people and some of the people are really good and and really smart and contribute a lot to the company. Um, and then those people get to a certain point and they realize I'm not going any further. Because I'm not part of the family. Right. And the family is never going to give away any of their stock in the company. It's the Italian so, one. <laughs> so the only thing they can do is they leave and start their own competing company. Yep. And naturally, it's in the same town because that's where they live. Right. And then the same thing happens to them. And the same thing happens to them. And all of a sudden, you have 10 oven builders in Verona. And you have uh, 15 packaging uh equipment companies in Bologna and you have all these uh, depositing you know batter depositing and, and cake decorating companies in Skio and it just goes on and on and, and mixing companies and you know whatever so the interesting thing is I, I represent a, a company that makes 
really amazing um, dough mixers um, called San Cassiano, and they're in Alba. And mm -hmm. the owner of that company, the person who started that company, was an out-of-the-box kind of guy. When he found the person that he wanted to keep as head of his design department, he offered him some stock. Yeah. And then the person who in charge of the production, he offered him some stock. I mean, the family still owns 85% of the company. Sure. But now all these other people feel invested in the company. They feel some sense of ownership. When people call, you know, it's it's not just a job. It's it's something that they own, that they're a part of, and that they represent. So he kept all his people. Uh, he didn't create competitors. Um, and... You know, the company just kept on thriving. So that's why there's all these own companies in Verona. Yeah. No, I, I I, literally, yeah, I imagined that when I was, like, studying that. I was like, I know what happened here because the same thing happened with the pizzerias in New York where mm -hmm. it was like, you know, you got somebody working there. That, well, that's what, when you were talking about that, um, that's what made me think of it. Oh, yeah. No, 100%. And I, when I was diving into the history of, like, you know, these, you know, uh, steam tube ovens and everything and, like, where they came from, like it see like the research that I did is they came from Germany and there was a guy who was working for them like you know somebody was probably from the Verona area uh -huh. and you know the and, same yeah. thing happened like he ended up you know yeah. all right uh I know what's going on now I mean yeah that being said I think that's um I mean I think that's an amazing way to do business like I've been given that like so much thought over the years and um it's definitely like for me in my business, which is, you know, it's very different from that. But I think it's a really good way to expand where if you have somebody that's like the heart and soul of the location, um, definitely don't be dumb about it. Like, just don't like, you know, you can't just hand somebody, you know, 25 percent of a company because, you know, what if they turn into a drug addict in like like five years? But if they're really doing their thing and this and that. Yeah, give them 25 points, get them vested in the company and, you know, make an arrangement where it's like, OK, you know, in six years, then you're vested. You're right. going to get your points. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Bar, you know, if you become Word a heroin bar. addict, you know, before five years or you disappear into like the Hawaii, you know what I mean? You're going to lose those points. You yeah. know what I mean? N N Nels, I think, has turned Bread Alone into an a employee-owned company uh, or is turning it into an employee-owned company. How does that work? I don't really I don't understand. Know. You don't know? <laughs> but I, I, I'm doing that um, in the sense of uh, preparing to give some stock to people in my company that I want to keep. Yeah. Um, because, okay, so you own a, a smaller percentage, but the idea is that if you keep these people, you're going to get bigger. So you own a smaller percentage of something bigger. That's exactly you know? how I think about it. And like some of my like old school Italian friends, because they don't, they're like, wait, 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 what are you talking about right now? This doesn't make any fucking sense. And I'm like, listen, bro, if I have 80 percent of a pie that's doing thirty thousand a week, as opposed to. Uh, 50% of a pie that's doing 100000 a week, where am I making more money? Right. You know what I mean? Right. It's, it's, it's like, to me, it's like a no-brainer. And then you, you know, you're kind of creating like, because um, it's, I mean, it's hard to open up a business. You know what I mean? I don't care if it's a, a bakery. I mean, we're talking about bakeries. The type of bakeries you're talking about, like, are like something that I'm just beginning to be able to like wrap my head around. Like when I first heard about this, these things and like these numbers, uh, I was just like, wait a minute. Yeah, like well, how, for example, I'm negotiating, uh, just starting negotiating now for another line for a, a big customer, um, to produce 9,000 pounds an hour of baguettes and other kinds of, you know, uh, ciabatta and other kinds of breads, 9,000 pounds an hour. And then what what is something ballpark like that like? Oh, the it, the equipment. It's in the millions, right? Oh yeah, the equipment for that will cost probably more than ten million. Ten million, Jesus Christ! But you're doing that much, and it's justified. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like, it's like how do you how do you get to the point? I mean, obviously, Bread Alone did it. Obviously, like, um, is Chad's? No, Bread Alone's not there yet. 
Not at well, that level. They're not, uh, but I'm saying, like, they went yeah. from a retail bakery right. with a brick oven to, like, I can't walk into a store in New York and not find them. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I can literally go on my phone right now, pull up my Grubhub, type in grocery, and 20 places will come up, and every single one of them I could get bread alone delivered here right now. Yeah. You and know? a lot of these big companies, um, actually, you don't even know their names because they're not. Uh, creating product that sells under their own name. They're private labeling. They're private labeling. Yeah. They're selling to food service. Um, it, there's all different variations on the, on the theme there. But, um, yeah, I, until I fell by accident into the bakery industry, I didn't even know it existed. Yeah. You know? How would you? I mean, bread especially. Like, pizza, at least you, like, kind of walk in there, and it's like bread is, like, a very... You know, it's an elusive thing. You know what I you mean? It's an elusive about, industry. And yeah. in general, you don't think about where does what, your bread where come does from? Any of your food come from? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. For the most part, I mean, I think a lot about where my food comes from. But up until you know, I dived into this bread thing. Like, I never, you know, if I'm I'm calling up the Italian guy down the street, I'm like, yo, let me. I need 75 heroes tomorrow for my sandwich. Like, it doesn't go further than that. I'm like, I think this guy's bread tastes good. Like, that's it. Like, yeah. that was the end of the discussion. Like, I was never thinking about, um, you know, growing up, and and neither were any of my peers or my mentors or the guys that taught me this business. It was just like, yeah, yeah, Johnny makes good bread over you. We like that, you know. Or this guy uses it. Like, there was no thought going into like the what kind of products they're using what kind of process they're using because the process of bread and and now and now the generation that's coming up wants to know more than that they want to know how do you treat your employees mm -hmm. and they want to know you know what's the source of the source of you know the source oh, yeah. of the stuff you, you know and it's it's again back to the discussion of giving you know stock to people in the company. It's also part of creating a, an atmosphere of a, a team. You know, I mean, things work better as a team when everyone's contributing and everyone feels a part of it. Yeah. So. No, a hundred percent. I just like. Yeah, I could see it in the way. I want to learn. I really want to learn more about it. Like, employ your own companies and how does it work? Because. I just don't understand it because I can't imagine it's a thing like what if I I go get a job at Bread Alone and then I leave in three months and uh, am I still an owner of the company? I would I wouldn't think so. Yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's probably uh, yeah. I want to dive into that. So is, is what? So tell me about like how you you know we were talking about Chad. Tell me about like how that happened. Okay. Um, so. Um we were we were looking at your bookshelf, and you were asking me who Michelle Suez was. Yeah, Michelle Suez uh, was a is French, and he uh, in the early days of the baking industry and uh, of the artisan baking industry in this country, um, he became a mentor to a lot of the uh, bakers, including Nancy, including Steve Sullivan, whatever. And, oh, he's a guy. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, he's a guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's not Michelle with two L L's and an E. It's <laughs> right, right, Michelle right. With it's a e French the Michelle. End. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Michelle. Michael. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, he he was involved when I first started working with La Brea Bakery, for example. Um, he was helping them to spec the equipment, even though I ended up selling it to them. Uh, he was advising them on what they should buy. Anyway, one day I get a call from him saying... Chad Robertson has been asking me about thermal oil, and I know you know you know more about it than anybody else. So, would you give him a call? I said, sure, I'll give him a call. Now, I had, I was, I don't think I was, I wasn't living in San Francisco at that time anymore. But I had lived in San Francisco, and I, I had eaten at his, at at Bar Tartine. And, tasted the bread and thought this is the best bread I've ever eaten in my life. And I'd been in the industry for, you know, 30, 30 plus years. Um, and, but I never in a million years thought of even approaching him about a thermal oil oven because he was making 200 loaves a day and there was no way that that was going to pay for itself. Right. But um, I said, okay, I'll, I'll give him a call. So I call him and he says, yeah, I'm interested. Can you send me some literature? I said, no. Um, but I'll come out and see you. 
and the reason I said that was because it's not something you can explain in in five minutes or from. I mean, you need to have a discussion with somebody. And, sure. Um, so he said, okay. So, I, so we set a time. That's not me, is it? No. Anyway. Hey, where's that phone? And just turn that off. Ugh, my bad. God. So, <clears throat> so I came out to see him. And uh, I walk into Bar Tartine, and I sit down, and he comes out. And before I could get a word out of my mouth, he says... Wait, wait hold on. I'm sorry. Yeah. Duke, Yo. go outside. There's pizza out there. Gotcha. <laughs> God. Sorry. Um, be- literally, before I could um, get a word out of my mouth, he comes up to me, and he says, I need more thermal mass. Okay. And I said, well, you just saved me two hours of explanation. <laughs> because he already got the, he already understood that, that that's what he needed. His bread is so hydrated. I mean, a lot of the stuff he does is like almost 100% hydration. And to get the, the oven spring and to get the, the power, the, the energy into the bread quickly enough, you need either a brick oven or you need a thermal oil oven. Right. And, and he had, that's why he wanted it. And, yeah, he, and I took him to Germany. He looked at the ovens. He saw what's going on. He, he understood it like like that intuitively. Now, is that – I know, you know, with the coronavirus and every day, is that thing still running? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, they're still that, doing the wholesale out of that. Well, th- right? this, this was at – well, okay. This was at the manufactory in San Francisco. Oh, okay. Okay. That Not was, the LA one. The LA one, he bought thermal oil ovens, but that has kind of fallen apart. Yeah. But that's not because of the ovens. <laughs> no, um, obviously. It was... It's, uh, it's uh, business reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Are you... And, uh, you want to take a quick break? Sure. Get a slice? All right. Sure. We'll be right back. Oh, sorry. Too bad you can't do takeout from Ratsa here. Huh? Too bad you can't do takeout from Ratsa Okay, so sorry, guys. Uh, we had to take a pizza break. We got uh, some amazing uh, pizza from Santo at Fazio's. It was really good. One of the best Sicilians in the world, in my personal opinion, just saying. And if you see orange around our mouths, that's the reason. That is the reason. <laughs> so well, I think we were talking about Chad uh-huh. and doing the thermoil like, switches. So I believe the last thing you said was um, before we got interrupted with pizza was like he was like i need more thermal mass right right that's right and and so i really didn't have to explain a lot to him. right um yeah and uh even someone like chad who can make incredible bread in any kind of oven right could see the difference in his, the first time that i actually he bought the oven without ever test baking in one because he understood the concept and he knew it was right oh I thought you said he went to Germany. He did after he bought it. After he bought it. (laughs) Yeah, Um, and actually, that it wasn't because. (laughs) No, he he um, he went to Germany and and saw a bunch of ovens and decided to buy buy it, but without ever test baking in one. But on a second trip over there, where we were actually going to test vacuum cooling technology. What is that? <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> uh, anyway, we were going there to, to, to test vacuum cooling. The uh, Hoif sent over to the vacuum cooling company a little test thermal oil oven so that Chad would be able to see the results that would be comparable to what he would get because he was going to be baking with thermal oil. So this was actually the first time he baked his bread in a thermal oil oven. And the first time he did so, because the vacuum cooling technology, he went to test, test the limits, he made a really, really highly hydrated dough. It was, it was, I would say it was over 100% hydration. Okay. Um, and when it went onto the baking hearth, it kind of just flattened out like a pancake. And we were both looking at each other. It was like, oh, this is never going to happen. Within a few minutes, it had 
pulled itself together and started doming up and and it was a beautiful you know there was a beautiful oven spring and he said turned around to me and he said everything you told me about this oven was true right so yeah you get more oven spring there's so much more energy from that thermal mass going into it immediately um, and that's from a combination of the low flash heat, which doesn't set the crust too soon, um, and allows the moisture to be retained. And there's also the conduction, obviously, from from the stone. Right. Um, I mean, there. We were talking about this in the in the break. There there are different ways to get heat to the product. There's conduction. Yeah. From the stone. There's radiation uh, from the radiator. There's um, convection, which is blowing air. Uh, what's the fourth one? Uh, infrared. Oh, infrared. Is, yeah, well, that's a kind of radiation anyway, though. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it says in my, my trusty modernist uh-huh. you know, pizza book. It's saying that infrared. I guess they're talking about it in, in terms of, like, the reflectiveness. So, like, mm-hmm. if you had, like, a, um, like, like a... Uh, like a rationale oven like this Uh this is like a rationale oven and all these kind of ovens like the reason why they're all mirrored is because apparently that sends off more um uh radi radiated heat yeah you know what i'm saying to the product i don't know a lot about that technology and the theory behind it yeah i actually when i was reading about it i was like wait what if like you like took like a like a a thermal oil or or uh you know like kind of uh, or even like a steam tube oven and like put mirrored paint over it. Like I have no idea like if well, that would work. The interesting thing is in the um, <clears throat> in the thermal oil ovens, the typical um, thermal oil ovens that Hoif builds, they actually paint the walls with a non-reflective black paint because they want the evenness of bake that you get from the oil in the radiator rather than adding to it with the reflection of heat from the sides of the oven. Huh, that is interesting. Because otherwise, despite how evenly the oil distributes the heat, because it's a liquid medium and it's flowing everywhere, and the the temperature differential between the entry point of the radiator and the exit point of the radiator is never more than uh, two degrees. Right. So you have a completely even bake all over your surface, which, by the way is the basis for why, because you can control the temperature that perfectly, that's why you're able to build a multi-deck oven. Remember at the very beginning I said I walked into the the booth and Franz Staub was explaining to me about the thermal oil and I realized, oh, the fact that I'm seeing a a multi-deck tunnel oven is a byproduct or a side effect of the fact that he's using thermal oil technology. But the point of the whole thing is the thermal oil technology. The reason is that if you have a multi-deck oven, it's not running continuously, right? Because you have to feed it somehow. So you feed it from a loader, and the loader goes up and loads a portion, whatever, however big the loader is, maybe it's, you know, 42 inches or 48 inches, whatever, worth of product, loads it into the oven. So the oven belt moves along with the loader as f- that same distance, and then it stops. Now the loader goes and brings stuff to the next shelf, and the next shelf moves in. So your product is moving through the oven intermittently. It start, it's moving, and then it sits, and it bakes. Then it's moving, and then it sits, and it bakes until you need to load some more onto that deck. In a conventional oven, the control of heat just isn't good enough that the heat is going to be equal everywhere. And it doesn't matter if you're sending the products through the oven continuously because every product will go through the same ups and downs. But if your product is sitting there and this part is hotter than this part, you're going to have great variation in your product. So you can never build a successful multi-deck system, a tunnel system like that, until thermal oil. But because with thermal oil you could control the temperature perfectly in every radiator to whatever you want, you can build that kind of a system. So with, like, 
Uh, so that my was a understanding, I don't remember I'm, what it was a digression from. No, no, no. Yeah. No, well, we were talking about chat. Well, let's stay on that for a second. So what the the oven, the turmoil oven that went into San Francisco, just because like I know a lot of our uh, audience is like in the pizza world and I don't think like because i'm just starting to grab a scope of this whole world mm -hmm. it, it's it's hard for us to wrap our head around because we're you know we've been spending our whole lives with like you know we see like a a four or five deck of it and it's like holy crap that's like that's insane you know what i mean um i just want to talk a little bit like so that turmoil that he got in san francisco like what like how many country loaves would that fit per thing or actually just tell me how big it is and i'll i'll do the math and i'll convert that into pizza yeah it, i can't remember exactly um i think it was somewhere in the range of 22 square meters of baking surface total or per deck total total so 22 22 Times meters 10.27 is about two you know probably 240 square feet or something of baking surface so it would be to how many how many meters i i'm not sure that this is accurate no, but i'm the, guessing it's around 22 square 22 square meters total 22 square meters so i don't know i might i might not be squaring this but uh <laughs> well it's that. a it's about 10 point if i remember correctly it's 10.27 square feet to a square meter yeah so i got 866 no. inches oh, so I would do no, 866 no, 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 no. Don't, squared. Don't, don't do it like that. Why? Just change it to square feet. And and it's going to be around 240 square feet. But then I got to figure out how much 240 square feet well, is in how, inches. Okay. Oh, 200 square. No. 20, 240 square feet would be like an oven that was 10 feet wide and 24 feet long. Feet two inches. Two inches. Sorry, guys. Brady will edit this out. Uh, oh, 34,000, yeah, it says. I don't know how you calculate square inches. Well, for... well, I'm calculating it like how many pizzas, how many 18-inch pizzas would this oven hold? Okay, so 18-inch pizzas, it's, it, how many, that's one and a half feet? And I said, so suppose you had a, uh, an oven that was 10 feet wide, um, or call it nine feet wide, right? So that would be one to six pizzas across let's call it six pizzas across okay and then um one and a half into 24 is uh eight 16 so six by 46 16. pizzas six by 16 six by 16 pizzas yeah oh 16 six, six times 16 six times 16 yeah 96. Okay, so you, you get about 118 inch pieces in that oven. 118 inch pieces yeah. in this oven. Yeah, that's a that's a monster oven. Okay. <laughs> so what kind of um what kind of volume would like that do like for bread? Like how many like you know loaves would you be trying to do with an oven like that? Is it in the thousands? Well, I mean, it's got to be right. I think I probably you probably calculate about. 10 loaves per square meter, so two, a, a little over 200 loaves per bake. Per bake. And how many decks is this one? I don't remember. I think it was five. five oh, so not not as big as the, the one in L.A. The one in L.A. was no, like no, no, 12. Not, not as big as the one in L.A. Yeah. No. So, yeah, we're talking... Yeah, I mean, I mean that, this is a couple hundred loaves per bake, whereas previously he was doing a couple hundred loaves per day. Per day, yeah, <laughs> no, of course, yeah, it's um, it's a complete like, it's a total game changer. Yeah, it's uh, and it's just a total like I've been preaching for years about the fact that like you know we kind of gotta we have to evolve somehow. You know what I mean? When you open up a pizzeria, um, you already have an oven. You already have a dough maker, dough machine. You have a fridge. You know what I mean? You have temperature control. You have pretty much all, almost everything you need to make bread. And, you know, the beautiful thing about bread, you know, with pizza, it's it's um, it's rough because you got to, you know, you're you're making like what you're 
shaping your balls into isn't your final shape. Your final shape doesn't happen until somebody orders a pizza. Mm. So, and then you have to stretch it, you have to sauce it, cheese it, top it, put it in the oven, um, and then you got to watch it, and you're doing that over and over and over again, like a la carte as it's coming in. With bread, you load up your oven, you unload your oven, and somebody hands you the bread, and you know, you hand them the bread, they hand you money, and you know, like, your baking day is done. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. In other words, it's it's all it's it's done before. Yeah. It's 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 pre done. You don't have to have somebody sitting there waiting for somebody to order a right. loaf of bread. Right. Like the bread's it's there. It's on shelves. You can sell it. And that's why I was starting to say earlier that one thing about pizza is that shelf life isn't as big a deal because people are mostly ordering it and eating it right then. Yeah, shelf life isn't as big of a deal, but um, it is if it's frozen the, pizza, the well, yeah, I mean, you're going into a whole different thing. Like, right. yeah, frozen pizza is, yeah, it's not. I've been to frozen pizza factories. It's it's a different game, and I think it's um, you know, like I'm seeing, I I I've been to these things that I've seen ways that they can improve. You know what I mean? Whether they want to or not, but. I mean, we're talking about like apples and oranges. Like it's, it's, I mean, even with Neapolitan pizza, Neapolitan pizza is something like that. It's almost undeliverable. Like, have you ever got Neapolitan pizza delivered or wood fired oven pizza delivered? Yeah. I mean, it, uh, it's like almost cold when it comes because. Right. And, and if you immediately, if, if you've heated up your oven and put a pizza stone in there and you immediately put it on there, you can crisp up the crust again. And it's absolutely, good. absolutely. But our goal, like, you know, from a New York side or from like, you know, you know, the pizza we just got is to get it to you. And, yeah. you know, guys yeah. like, I mean, we're psychos. Like we got pizza stones, we right. got baking steels, like loaded up in our ovens. Right. Like the, your average customer isn't that person. Um, right. So, I mean. I want to I want to actually start sending out like diagrams like to show them like hey here's a link to baking seals and pizza stones like all different things and here's a step by step thing and start taping them to the pizza box because well and and so and the more high end you know DOC pizza places do that right oh do they I've and never th I, um, there's this place in Atlanta called Amatza that you know gives you instructions on how you should reheat your pizza how you so, should reheat yeah. the pizza yeah. 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 It's uh, I mean, it's a genius idea, but you're still I mean, if you reheat a Neapolitan pizza at like 500 degrees, even if you stick it in for a minute, I mean, you're almost getting like it's a different it's even a different product than when you get it in the restaurant, too. I yeah. mean, it's a good product, I think. Yeah. But yeah, we're always trying to figure out, like, how do we, you know, just deliver the best and even from like like the oven to the table, even. Because, you know, you put it on a metal pan or an aluminum, you know, pizza pan and aluminum like just heats up so quick that, you know, you get condensation in the crust to even like within a minute, like if you stick your hand underneath it, it's too hot to touch. And because of that, you're creating like this condensation where, you know what I mean? You're losing that crisp like at, almost at, instantly. At Antico in, uh, in Atlanta. They deliver them on 18 by 26 typical, you know, baking, uh, baking trays, bun pans, basically, with um, the grated. Paper. Okay. No, with with, uh, with uh, what do you like mean partial bun, paper? Bun pans. Bun pan is just the industry name for the 18 by 26 uh, baking tray that's common everywhere. Oh, okay. That fits in a rack, you know, and they just. And these are round pies. Yeah, they're yeah. Oh, okay. But they just. Those things are cheap and easy, and they take them out. They put it in the thing with paper on it, and they bring it over to your bench and give it to you. On yeah, that. and just give it to you on yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, it, you know, the parchment paper is, you know, it's definitely gonna, you know, give give a layer of like insulation, so you're not getting that, um, and it's gonna suck up some of the moisture. But yeah, it's always like the bane of our freaking lives is like trying to figure out. It's like. Well, now, how do we deliver this, like, in a pizza bag with the steam and everything else and, like, try to get as close to the product as possible? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, but going back to the bread thing, I've just been talking about, like, I mean, for so long on just, like, 
hey, you can, because, you know, in our artisanal baking generally, obviously not all the time, but generally it's a cold fermented product after it's shaped. You know what I mean? You're, um, you're mixing, you're getting to gluten, full gluten development, you're, you're doing your folds, you're bulk fermenting, you're pre-shaping, you're final shaping, and then, you know, you're either going on to uh, couches. Couches, yeah. Couches. Yeah. At, or you're going into a, a baton or... But, but, uh, a, a banneton. Banneton. Yeah. And then you're going in the fridge. Mm -hmm. So now, like, the thing that, like, scares, like, a lot of guys, especially, like, old school guys, is they're like, what do you mean? You're, how are you going to do bread in the thing? You're going to wake up at midnight? And I'm like, no, it's, like... You don't have to do that anymore. You know what I mean? Because that's that's how bakeries operate, like in New York and New Jersey. Like uh, you know, Italian bakeries and bakeries in general. Um, you know, the ones that we're familiar with. The guy who's your friend that's a baker, who's I mean, not even really your friend because you don't even never see him. You know, you know his name's Biagio, but you you don't have much interaction with him because. He's getting to work at midnight. That's so interesting because when I first started traveling to Germany, like when I took uh, Nancy Silverton's husband, Mark Peel, to see the thermal oil ovens for the first time, you would be amazed at, the again, the amount of money that these bakeries have spent on equipment to produce a quantity that, you know, in, in this country, you would never spend that kind of money to, to produce. Right. Because they, they had to deliver fresh in the morning, and their workers weren't allowed to come in before 3 for labor laws. Before? Before 3 a.m. Before 3. Oh. They couldn't come in until 3 a.m. Oh. Because of labor laws. So they had a very short time period in which to bake off all this stuff. So they had banks of ovens. Right. You know? um, and, so of course, the they other part of that is that the bread is real fresh. Well, how did they – so so they would have to – you're saying that – I mean, they were cold fermenting the dough, obviously, so, from so, the day so before. So what they use are um, what are called retarder proofers, which okay. are programmed. So, you know, they keep it at a certain temperature until a certain time, then it raises to this other temperature, this other humidity for this amount of time, et cetera, et cetera. It's all but you're broken. talking about like a giant, like not a rack. You're talking about like a room. Yeah. It's like a retarder proofer room. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. I've seen, I've seen like the one and two rack ones. And well, I they, they make, I mean, they, they make them for one or two racks. And, yeah. and I, I think at the manufactory, uh, we sold Chad one um, that was, Three racks, I think. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's go into this. This is interesting, <laughs> man. And, like, I got all kinds of ideas about this. Wait, so you're talking about, like, what, what is it? explain this to me. This is like a walk-in fridge that's no. a retarded well, grouper? Well, it, it, they can be. It depends how, how many, you know, how many racks. Can I, can I put metro shelves in this thing? Yeah. I mean, they're built to order. All this stuff is built to order. So it's like ordering a walk-in fridge and being yeah. like, I want, like, 12 by 8. Yes. Retarder proofer? Yeah. No. Yeah. Bro, you're going to, like, revolutionize this shit, bro. You know <laughs> what I could do with that? With, like, pizza? Like, that, like, changes the whole game because then... But, wait, so with the retarder proofer, but you're mixing the dough the day before, shaping, you pre-shape, you final shaping, then throwing it in there, and well, then setting that thing. Yeah, I mean, it, generally, you don't, do your, you don't need to do your bulk fermentation in there because your bulk fermentation is in a closed... Um, environment anyway. Sure. But the thing about the retarder proofer is that it has um, control over humidity, so that you don't need to cover the product. Uh, it's not going to dry out. You're not going to get a skin on it. Okay. Um, and in fact, this one company that is now part of Hoift that they bought, um, I won't tell you the whole history of how it happened, but this guy um, came up with a really innovative way of creating the humidity. Ah. Because in most um, in most proofers, in most retarder Proofers, a, a retarder, re, to retard is to slow it down, right? So you're slowing down the fermentation. Um, you're not, and you're developing more flavor over more time. But um, you need a certain temperature, and you need to maintain that temperature, and you need a lot of humidity to keep it from getting a skin. So unlike a, fr a refrigerator, which tends to be a um, a high 
velocity um, of air movement yeah. um, that, that will dry your product. This has to be a high volume and a low velocity. Is so it? that's what makes a retarder different from a refrigerator. Okay. So it's it's high it's it's a high it's a high um, volume of air and a low velocity of air movement rather than the uh, a regular refrigerator, which is a high velocity and low volume. <laughs> like a restaurant fridge, like yeah, a walk-in yeah, fridge, or even your fridge at home. So, um, do fridges at home have fans? Yeah. They, oh, have they, to get the, yeah, they have to get the air in there some. Oh, I know we're here. Maybe and, they do. Maybe they turn on when they're closed. Well, like, I know for, like, uh, like flower fridges or, like, um, things like that, like, instead of, like, if you walk into, like, any restaurant, like, you know, on a big refrigerator, you can have, like, two, three, four fans that are just blowing. You know what I mean? And it's, you know, it's pretty aggressive. Yeah, um, right. Where if you go to, like, a flower fridge or, you know, at, like, a florist, um, They'll usually have their unit up top, and it's like three or four fans, but they're sucking in and, yes, you know, kind of letting exactly. the air. Exactly, and then it comes in from the sides. and the yeah. yeah. So managing the airflow is one part of it, but managing the humidity is another part. And normally it's done by heating water up uh, to the boiling point and getting steam, and then you push steam into the box. But then you have issues where the steam is really hotter than the temperature you want the box to be. Yeah, so <laughs> so there's this co constant back and forth again with temperature up and down and up and down and up and down when you put steam in and then it raises the temperature too much then you have to refrigerate it some more then you it's back and forth. This guy invented a system which is based on nature. Okay. Go into the into the woods in the winter and you look at a stream and there's a fog over it. Uh -huh. Why? No idea. Because the water temperature is higher than the air temperature. Okay. So when the water temperature is higher than the air temperature, it naturally creates this fog. Uh -huh. So he did that in these boxes. He takes a, 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 a stream of water that he heats to whatever is a little bit higher than the air temperature you want. It creates this natural fog. You're not p putting in hot... 212 degree steam into the box. You're just creating humidity in a, in that natural, gentle way. That is fucking genius. When did he invent that? Was it not that long ago, or not was it a long, long time ago? Not, it was no, not, not that long ago. No. Huh? So he calls it uh, soft steam. Soft steam. Yeah. That. And now you're gonna have like so much less fluctuation because I'm thinking about like. You know, even one of these, like, cheap proofers that you see in, like, some pizzerias. Most pizzerias don't even have a proofer. Right. Um, but, yeah, that's what, yeah, they have this, um, you know, kind of, you know, thing, pan that you pour water in and, you know. Um, yeah, but then those usually have electric elements in them that, that heat the water up and boil. And those electric elements have to be way hotter than you're trying to than your well, target it, temperature. Well, and that, that's sort of yeah, that that's sort of irrelevant. The point is that you have to you have to boil the water to get steam, right? And to get the humidity into the rest of the box. Sure. So the that steam is always were, the steam isn't going to be colder than yeah. 212 degrees, right? Yeah. How would you control humidity if you were trying to retard after proofing? Is kind of what it is, right? Like, well, yeah, so you have to do a lot of refrigeration at the same time. So yeah. You, and then you get, have all the condensation problems. And, you know, here you're just whatever temperature you want the box to be at, you just have this water running at a little higher temperature than that. And, and it creates and steam. If it you had it, fog. for instance, at, you know, obviously I'm like picturing this perfectly like in the cold, but now I'm like going backwards into the hot, like where it's like, let's say I want my temperature at 95 degrees. So the water would be heated up to 198, yeah, 110, yeah. and that would still work, even yeah. at those temperatures. There's no like yeah. limit to this. this yeah, is just... It's, just, it's just the physics of it, which I don't understand. But <laughs> it's the physics of it that if you, if you have the water temperature higher than the air temperature, it creates um, natural humidity. Do you know anything about these Levon machine things? No. The sourdough machines? I've seen oh, them the online. Levin. Um, uh, yeah, uh, sure. They're like... Uh, sure. It's like a tank. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Fermenta See, fermentation tanks, yeah. Yes. So 
I saw these things online. I used one once. I couldn't like figure out like the controls on it or anything. I was like, it, it was it was very very difficult. I was like, and I was trying to look online. I think it was like a German company, and I was they didn't really have like good videos. I kind of get it. Because originally when I first saw them, I, I thought this thing would just like feed your sourdough for you. I thought like like it would just like like inject flour and inject water into that tank and then mix it for you. And then it's just like, yeah, you just empty it and you, well, you know. Well, usually you have to put in the, the flour. You got to put in the flour and the water in yeah, the starter. But in a very automated system, no, of course. I mean, again, there's all kinds of esoterica related to this kind of equipment as well. And there's all kinds of levels of automation depending on you know your production sure, and how much you want to spend. Yeah, if you're in, if you're buying but, a giant thing. Right. But yeah, generally, um, what you're talking about, you, you have to add add the the liquid and you have to add the uh, <laughs> the flour. But then what it does is it mixes it mm -hmm. and it controls um, the temperature for you until you want to use it. Right. So this is and this is where it like kind of gets into this like new level because I was I was looking at the website and it was kind of showing like you know because I, I I understand like you know if you're doing a warm fermentation like on a sourdough you're you're favoring um, lactic acid lactic <laughs> bacterium and you know on a cold fermentation you're uh, acetic, acetic. Yeah, right. um, so yeah it's kind of like this thing where like yeah you're creating this and then it, it spins all the time too it like well, constantly you don't really want it to spin all the time well you want it to agitate it very slowly because you don't want it destroying any of the um bro sell products. me a levant machine right now tell me it sell me why do i need a levant machine can you do that or that's like the wrong product well no i mean i i do we do sell those <laughs> um, i'm just i'm just trying to get a greater understanding it's, it's just of these a, things. Uh, once again it's a matter of having more control over what you're doing and having to do focus a less of your own time doing that okay um, in other words you you will set it to the temperature that you want it to work at until it you know reaches a certain level and then you'll want it to cool and hold it for you at that temperature so that it doesn't grow anymore um and you can you just set it to do this and and there's slow agi you can control the agitation so that it's more or less and you can control the agitation so that it only agitates like once every minute or once every two minutes or whatever just to keep it you know going well i mean that's one of the biggest differences in like doing a wild yeast starter culture like you know in a more traditional like just in cambro because you wouldn't be like sitting there you know you make it if it's a 12 hour if it's a 24 hour if whatever you trained it to be like well, you're not again, sitting there mixing well, it again it talks it it's it it's very a different thing if you're making a biga if you're making a poolish right you know i mean more i'm talking more about a poolish kind of liquid ferment no absolutely i'm talking about the same thing like i'm not making 50 percent hydration poolish yeah you can't throw that in one of those right. no i'm but i'm saying like if i'm making 100 percent hydration poolish or whatever we want to call it um yeah probably more than 100 percent. but well yeah yeah if i mean you could go I mean, I put I put a hundred percent in that machine, one of those machines, the one I tried, but I, it was yeah, it was fine, but it was just like if I were to make one, like you know, let's say I'm in my place tomorrow and I have to make pizza, like how I do that is, I I figure out if I'm gonna do a twenty percent inclusion of wild yeast starter culture into my product. I'm going to, you know, calculate that, calculate my percentage, calculate how much flour I'm doing. Now, if I'm doing 20,000 grams of flour in a batch, I would do, you know, 20,000 times, you know, 20, it's 4,000 grams. So I'm going to mix, you know, obviously, you you know, you lose a little bit. So I'm going to do, you know, the amount that would equal 4,000 grams of that with a train starter that's you know you feed it at 11 it's ready at 11 you know i i you know you can make a starter that's ready every 12 hours or you can take a mature starter and feed it you know it's all semantics but what i would do is if i had to make five batches i would have five different cambros with that you know made at the right time train the right way come back the next day dump it in you know what i mean where 
but it would never be agitated. Like I, I never. I mean, I don't. It might be a thing, and that I don't even know about. Like the agitation uh, is more about making sure that the temperature remains distributed properly from the outside and the inside, because typically these things are are jacketed and and chilled. Yeah. So you want to make sure that it's not colder on the outside than it is on the inside. Right. So you're agitating it just to distribute the temperature more than anything else. Okay. But it's, I mean, I feel like, I mean, I might be 120% wrong about this, but it almost like, it looked like a completely different product what I made than what I'm normally doing in like a Cambro. It just, it looked different and smelled different (laughs) and it was the same you know, thing that I've been working with for years and years and years and years and years that I have like a lot of experience with. And after like four days of one of those things, it was just like, Uh, it was, no, it was working. It was just, it was completely different. It was, it was like, um, yeah, it was still a hundred percent hydration, but I don't know if it's because of like, cause there's a, there was a blade in it Mm -hmm. that was like, you know, it was almost like a blender blade. In this machine, it started with a Z. It was like Z U. I don't know. There's lots of different manufacturers, but yeah, yeah. As I said, the the blending, in my understanding, is more about just equalizing the temperature, because you're getting your chilling from the walls. Okay. So, all right. On that note, I want to move on because I I I don't understand this shit completely and i want to get a greater understanding of it like so we just went and looked at like an electric oven right Mm -hmm. and kind of what it is and there's you know i mean this is pretty standard for the pizza industry there's no there's no stone on there i I mean i think this is an electric oven you can see it right there Mm -hmm. it's there's i mean there's no stone it's all kind of you know thin steel or aluminum and the heating elements are exposed um, well, there was stone hearth, no? There's stone on the bottom, yeah. but I'm saying, like, if I put that pizza in there, like, there's, you know, heat radiating, yeah. like, down, like, yeah. almost like a flame, and yeah. which kind of makes sense because that's what those ovens were originally built to do, mm-hmm. was, you know, Capone um, came out of, like, you know, Italy and Europe where they were, you know, trying to recreate what they were doing in italy obviously which was a much higher temperature product than what we do in america um with an electric oven so this is how it looks to me and like i said i I, I love your input on this it's like that's almost like the flame Mm because that thing is getting way hotter i mean that these ovens go from my oven upstairs goes from zero to 700 in like 20 minutes um so we're we're you know uh I, I don't know how fast an oil therm uh thermal oil oven heats up, but um you know a steam tube I believe is hours, and I know a regular pizzeria gas oven is also hours and hours. You know what I mean? Well, you want like a good yeah, four with the thermal oil oven. It's just a question of where did it start? Because I mean, if the first day it takes time to heat everything up. And I can't remember the figure of how many um, degrees per minute it, it it heats up. It heats up rather fast, but not anywhere near like an electric oven. Right. But it also doesn't ever lose that temperature completely. Whereas an electric one, you turn it off, there's no temperature left. It's gone immediately. Right. So right. yeah, is it that like kind of the point? Is it that like getting like I mean, what I'm finding is like, well, can you do you have like a good definition of what flash heat is? Flash heat is flash heat is the excess heat that you get uh, when you don't have product to absorb the excess heat that is the heat differential between the the heat transfer uh, medium and the baking chamber temperature. So like let's say this is like let's say this bar right here is the is the heat element on the electric oven okay and here's the stone Mm -hmm. you're saying that flash heat is when there's not a pizza in there you got the the temperature set to 500 right and because that's going down on that now that's like 560 or it's more than that or it's even more than that But the point is and you'll you'll see it because the pizza's on either side of it 
the part near the hole will get darker. They'll burn. Right. That's flash heat. That's flash heat. So because that part got hotter than you wanted it to because it got to this temperature rather than the temperature you want. Okay, that makes sense and I know, you know, I own a couple I own a few electric ovens mm -hmm. um from a few different companies and I know that um you know, if I'm looking for 575 when I'm busy, that oven's got to be at like 550, 560 otherwise when I put the first pie in it's going to burn if there's nothing in there for a long period of time. Um, so, okay. Next question is, see what I'm, I'm trying to just like understand, I guess I'm trying to understand like the way that I see it. Hold on. Let me grab a, a tool. <laughs> I'm going to grab a tool real quick. All right. This is how I'm seeing it. <laughs> I'm seeing it like this. So okay. I got a. Turn on your video now. Yeah. Switch to YouTube. So, <laughs> no, so I'm seeing it like, like that element mm -hmm. that's here, mm -hmm. when that thing, like, when it's trying to get back up to temp, when it's trying to recover. Because, like, bread and pizza, here's another place where, like, bread and pizza is like a huge fork in the road. Like, if you have an a, a, a electric oven with steam injection from, you know, whoever, um, from a bread company you when you're and you're making bread with it and that's what you're doing you're you're opening the oven you're loading up the whole oven you're steaming it okay you're closing the door and that door is closed until the product's done well yeah other than the fact that you want to let the steam out at a certain point so you have a damper that right you so you have it right. yeah so with pizza you're constantly opening and closing the door opening and closing the door you're constantly unloading and loading so, so you don't need steam, do you? No, no, no. We Sorry. don't need steam. But what I'm saying is, is that like whatever whatever heat is in there, like it's constantly being let out and, and, and that's being why pulled you want, out more. That's why you want the thermal mass, which will hold the heat. Right. So now this thing's got to turn on at whatever temperature. And I feel like when that thing turns on and it's trying desperately to go from you know, it wants to be at 550. It's supposed to be at 550, but now you just loaded and unloaded deck and loaded it again, and now it's probably at 450. That's why the that's why the electric. So it's um, like this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Instead of you know radiating. That's why when, out. when you look at even an electric stove, while it's heating up, the the coils get red, and then when they get to the temperature they want uh, you want, then they aren't red anymore. Yes. That's Same. that's how these work. Yeah. It's the same exact thing. So it's almost like, and it's, and it might, it's, it's, you know, that like having this is, I mean, I don't know if that's right, but that's how I'm seeing it happen. And that's how I'm seeing it happen in, in, um, in practice too, because when you, um, like I could go upstairs and, you know, I could light up my wood fired oven outside. I could light up this oven and, you know the product that comes out at a certain temperature is pretty similar you know what i mean it's it's um i think there's like a a temperature that you pass where you know you're you're almost like you you know when you're cooking with a direct flame like this on something it's obviously going to be different than cooking with like um straight up convection or cooking off of a brick that's radiating heat or cooking off of you know the ther uh, thermal oil that's you know mimicking that mm -hmm. same thing because it's this is hotter than your target temperature so where i think what you were saying with therm thermal oil is that if you want your oven to be you know 500 degrees the thermal oil is going to be at 485 or the other way around the other way around, the yeah, other way around. just slightly hotter so just slightly hotter where this not, not fire a, not enough to create a noticeable. 2000 fucking degrees right, right. not That's enough it. to create a, a noticeable flash heat yeah. yeah so so wouldn't i mean wouldn't that be kind of like how people should see it is that like okay you have you have a heat source like your heat source that's heating up your oven, whether it's, you know, uh, a, a 
black brick oven, like like a Neapolitan oven. Um, I mean, black oven just means when the heat source, whether it's like a coal or wood or whatever, is directly on the surface and in the you in know the chamber, yeah. in the chamber and in the general area where it's directly affected the product. You know, um, is what we're talking about. So like, how hot is that flame? It's too. It's I don't know, two thousand degrees, and it's standing <laughs> right there, right? But how much? How hot is this heat element? It's obviously got to be much, much hotter than four hundred fifty or five hundred right. or right. five hundred fifty degrees. Because what it's trying to do is it's trying to get the baking chamber air to a certain temperature. Yeah, exactly, and that's that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to like, you know. I I, I guess I understand it in my head, but I'm trying to. Um, you know, articulate it like a lot better. You know what I mean? Where I'm just like, no, I mean, it seems to me like you do understand. I mean, yeah, but <laughs> it's just like, how does, but, but here's, here's where it gets confusing. So radiation heat, uh -huh. technically, right. What's happening with the thermoil, what's happening with the, the steam tube oven, what's happening with the, this flame and what's happening with that element at that oven are all considered radiation heat. Yeah. But they're obviously different because right, this is obviously much different than right, a thermal the, oil oven. But, but as I understand it, um, the main difference in the effect is going to be the f how much hotter that radiant heat source is than the temperature you want to bake at. Yeah. And that how much hotter is dependent on how quickly that energy can replenish itself as the product draws the, the energy out of that source. Right. So because air is so, so bad, for example, um, you have to heat the air a lot hotter than you want it to be. Uh, otherwise, you can't regenerate that temperature fast enough to catch up mm. whereas with thermal oil there's so much energy in that oil that you just put in more oil at that temperature and like i said it's 2600 times the the um the energy content in a cubic centimeter of that oil as in a cubic centimeter of air right so <laughs> and 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 you can do a thought experiment yeah 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 um think think of Think of a rack oven, a rotating rack oven. Yeah. Okay, you heat it up to, you know, 350 degrees, say. Just even say 350 degrees. Sure. Don't even say 450. Say 300. Well, say 450. Now, you open the door to that oven because you want to put your rack in, right? You can put your hand in there, I mean, briefly, you know, and then pull it out. It's okay. I mean, it'll be hot, but, you know, you're not going to burn your hand. Yeah, I can leave my hand on that thing. Okay. <laughs> Now try imagine putting your hand in 450 degree oil. No. How no. Same temperature, right? Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah, that's the difference, huh? That's, but that's that's the immediacy of the heat transfer. So and then and then the difference between and I probably should have had the mic closer. No, 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 you're fine. <laughs> All right. Brady, Brady's Brady's working He's on your levels. Right? Yeah. So then, <laughs> so then. All right. Now, now I want to see it. now. All right. I think I get the, I get the thermal oil now. So in a, in a steam tube oven, it's really, so the steam is heating up those tubes and are the tubes creating the thermal mass? No, it's the thermal mass is in the steam. The thermal mass is in the water, steam. Because water, water is a better conductor of uh, energy of heat than air is. It's just not as good as oil. But I mean, yeah, I mean, you you can burn yourself a lot faster in put put you know putting it in two hundred twelve degree steam than putting it into two hundred twelve degree air. Okay, but but you're saying that like the metal tubes, like like you you know like we were talking about yeah, the bricks before that are right. creating like thermal mass. Right. So all those metal tubes that go through it, they're not the they're thing the that's... means of you know holding the steam in and they're generating the the radiation but the thermal mass is in the is in the heat transfer medium itself which is the steam which is under pressure because you can't get steam without pressure above 212 degrees but you want to bake at 500 degrees right so you have to pressurize it 
Ah, uh, and then how that's hot makes, that steam? That's five, you know, probably close to six hundred for five eighty, maybe. Five eighty, so, six hundred. Yeah. And water, it doesn't like it has like a point where it can't get hotter, right? Steam is that? Well, there comes to well, a point but where it's you, under you pressure. Yeah, you don't want to pressurize it beyond a certain point. It, I mean, that, but that is one of the dangers of steam tube ovens is they are under a lot of high pressure. Right. And and one one of the things that I did when I started selling thermal oil ovens in this country was I made sure that they didn't call them thermal oil boilers, which is what they would tend to do because it looks like a boiler. But it's it's not a boiler immediately makes everyone say, oh, oh, pressure, danger, safety, you know. Right. And so I call it, decide I said you have to call it a heat exchanger, which is what it is. Heat exchanger. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's only under maybe a half an atmosphere of pressure. I've heard the cyclotherm ovens have a history of exploding. Is that true? Not that I'm aware of. No. I mean cyclothermic ovens, the heat transfer medium that's flowing through the radiators is air. Yeah. So it's, it's not like, under pressure. It's just that you heat the. I mean, it's being blown through the tubes, but it's just that you've heated that air with a flame, and then you're pushing it through the tubes. Yeah, I don't know where I heard it, but I, I was like, because I, I never, up until like a year ago, I'd never even heard of cyclothermal ovens, and I was like, I was like, what the hell is that? That's and, that's kind of the most traditional um, of the modern systems of. Heating industrial is that where what people you think that's what people use the most in like bakeries? Really? Yeah. Oh, I had no idea. I thought I thought they would have used. Uh, yeah, I thought it would have been like steam tubes or rack ovens. The the uh, well, once you get past rack ovens and you know for into tunnel ovens or bigger ovens, cyclothermic ovens are the most common. Oh, for tunnel ovens, yeah, I'm talking about for deck ovens. De Whenever even, I'm even, talking even, about ovens, I'm talking about deck ovens. Even, even deck ovens. Even deck ovens. The artisan bakers will um, prefer steam tube ovens because they make a better product. Because they right. have a lower delta T, a lower temperature differential, less flash heat. And they didn't know about thermal oil, and thermal oil is more expensive. Um, but, yeah, the, the steam tube ovens were, f I mean, that, that w all, most of the artisan bakers in this country learned about artisan baking and natural sourdough baking um, from the French. Right. From people like uh, Paulin and, you know, some of these other um, French bakers who kind of revived the traditional methods. Sure. And um, in France, the most, um, the most common artisan bread ovens besides the old brick oven, which a lot of people still would have, would have been right. steam tube ovens because they do a better job than cyclothermic ovens. But I've noticed actually like a real shift where like now you have this like crazy generation. And it, I mean, you can you could throw I mean, I know Chad Robertson went to France and, you know, studied in France and did different things. But I don't, I'm not sure about this, but I'm pretty sure like uh, I remember reading his book. Like, I don't think he was like working. You know, I think he was working in a guy with like a some type of wood fired oven. Yeah. Brick yeah, oven that's scenario. What I that's what um, I remember as well. Yeah. But a lot of the guys that I see getting into this, they have no idea what uh, thermal oil ovens are. They don't know what cyclo ovens are. Like they don't know what steam tube ovens are. They're just kind of like most of them are buying electric that I see online. Like just out of like, all right, this is an oven, or they're just you know going out there and just going online and picking a brand. And, yeah, this and is... like after they pick the brand, <laughs> they have no like so they'll pick a brand and they'll be like, oh, I know this guy uses this brand. Right. But like that brand might make a cyclotherm, a steam tube and a electric oven. And they're just buying something off of eBay, not knowing, having no clue what it is. Yeah. Unfortunately, this is something that um, I've been dealing with uh a lot is that in the last 20 years, um, people have gotten more and more used to buying things online and doing their own research. And fewer and fewer understand the value of having a guide. Right. An experienced well, guide a lot or of mentor. Them, a lot of like them that. right now, especially I would say in the past, like, re I mean, a lot of the past five years, but even in the past 10 years, you know what I mean? Um, they're all self-taught. 
they're yeah, taught that's in what a, I mean. because they're because taught in the, a Dutch oven and the the tartine col- bread. Right. The, exactly. And you know, I mean, you can make pretty good bread that way. You you can make really good bread that Not way. Not on an industrial scale, though. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Not even close. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've had. Um, but the point is, people are used to um, that this is the way you buy things now, um, rather than trusting somebody to lead you in the right direction. They're all, you know, skeptical that you know, salespeople are just into selling. Whereas for right. me, sales is more education. Yeah. No. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that one hundred and twenty percent. It's um, yeah, it's. You know, I mean, there, there's there's also like a lot of problems with doing it that way. Like, I mean, on from what I've seen in bread ovens, because you know, what do you do when the thing breaks? You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like with pizza ovens, it's never like with like old school pizza ovens, it's um, it's not an issue because you know I've used this example five times, but it's because it's true. They're built like 1940s Buicks. You know what I mean? You open up the hood of a 1940s Buick and there's like 10 parts in it. Yeah, you know what I mean? Okay. It's not complicated at all. It's it's things that can be, you know, that are read, all the parts are readily available, whatever. It's not specialized things. Um, so, but what do you do, you know, if you buy, I see these bread ovens and, you know, whether it's steam tube or cyclothermic or, um, I mean, even the electric, like, w- what happens if it breaks? Like, where do you go? What do you do? Like, there's not a lot of options if you can't call a guy that you bought it from and be like, hey, bro, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, you call a bakery equipment service company. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, but I'm, I'm sure, like, those <laughs> things have their limitations. I know for 100% of fact, like, I'm, I'm, I've am I'm, never worked at, like, a traditional bakery in my life. I know there's a ton of them. I'm sure there's a system for that. One of the big problems with pizza, though, is, you know, you know, if, if that oven I have upstairs, if it breaks, like, in, in one of my restaurants, like, there's I gotta call a guy, he's in California, you know what I mean? He's gonna be like, oh, admit, hopefully he has the part on hand, but he's still gotta fucking overnight it to me, and then he's gonna try to talk to me like I'm an electrician, and I'm not an electrician, I'm a pizza guy. So now I gotta go find somebody who he could talk to, because nobody, there is no service for these things. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you buy any Italian pizza oven on the market right now, there is zero option for service. There's yeah. not like a guy you could call that's going to be there. But and and this is the reason I like uh, selling industrial level equipment <laughs> because I'm <laughs> well, selling. There's no fucking be- choice at that I, point. No, because I'm selling to companies that have their own in-house maintenance people and engineers. That oh, right. I can just you kind of need the part, that on that level, and I right? can explain to them, you know, what to do with it, and they can do it. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the highest level, you know, uh, industrial bakeries, they'll probably have more engineers and maintenance people on staff than they have bakers. Really? Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. Well, that's. Yeah. Because <laughs> the machines are the bakers at that point. They're right. the employees and you have to maintain right. those machines. How many how many industrial bakeries are in america is it like hundreds is it thousands like yeah um i i ought to know this and i don't really but it's a lot it's a lot more than you would imagine it's a it's a lot it's it's over a thousand you think yeah i would think so you think it's all yeah i have no idea because i see these things and they're just they're they're insane but then you know you walk into any supermarket and look in the bread aisle and that's you know that's just one out of how many you know hundreds of thousands of supermarkets mm-hmm. you know what i mean and like what it what it takes six thousand wow that's uh that's crazy we got duke, duke over here helping out duke's duke's playing young uh young jamie over here <laughs> yeah 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 so how do you how do you calculate like delta T? Is that something that like the manufacturers kind of do, or is that something that yeah. you know you find a guy to do that? Because no, I've no, been no. thinking about I like I don't know how to do it. Um, I've been thinking about tracking down like a thermal engineer, like you know, just 
showing up to Rutgers University School of Engineering or like I don't know if the NYU has one of those things, but I'll, I'll go wherever the fuck I gotta go. I'll go to SU- or what is it SUNY NYU, whatever the hell's in New York, you know, and whatever the hell's in Jersey. And yeah, and then we got Boston up the street. I'm gonna just start breaking down doors and be like, "Hey, Nino Caniglio, really interested in ovens? Who wants to write a thesis about ovens? Let's do it." You know what I mean? I don't know. Find like a grad student or something because like I, I want I want all the secrets. So I would I would guess that like. But remember what man- Franz Staub said: the secrets of thermal oil aren't in the books. Well, not thermoil. <laughs> like I don't need to learn how to make, like how to manufacture just, a thermal I'm just, oven. Oh, I'm just no, teasing. I know. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just uh, I don't know. I'm just uh, I'm I'm hungry, bro. I just want to. I, so learned, do these I just companies... learned today, by the way. This is um something. The Hoif company recently sold a thermal oil, a small thermal oil tunnel oven, actually the smallest one they'd ever built. To a company in Finland for pizza. Oh, really? Yep. Okay. But the guy insisted. I mean, they were trying to say, you know, are you sure you want to spend all this money for, you know, that production? And what is he, is he, he, is he doing like frozen pizza? Is he doing? I don't know anything. I'm sure. I mean, he has to be, right? Yeah, I'm sure it is. But um, how do you use a, how do you use any tunnel oven for pizza if you're not doing it frozen? Yeah, right. Uh, or it could be frozen, or it could be um, like I have a, a real pizza expert in Italy who does huge, huge production lines and whole factories. There's a there's a company in Spain called Casa Teradeus that kind of owns the largest market share now in um, of uh, p- distribution, you know, frozen pizza and stuff in Spain. Okay. And um, this guy in Italy named Luigi Benetti developed with them a process for a refrigerated case restaurant quality pizza. The, so it's never frozen. Yeah, it's called like ready fresh, I think. I, I don't. Well, yeah, it's not called that in Spain. But uh, the idea is it it it'll it'll have a shelf life in your deli case for three weeks. Right. Um, without losing any of its. Uh, qualities. Yeah, you're seeing that popping up in American supermarkets yeah. all over where they have this kind of like turbo air, open air um, you know like case inside the supermarket and they'll have, you know, all kinds of, they call it ready fresh is mm-hmm. uh, you know, what the marketing term I believe is now, but yeah, they'll have a pizza in there that's not frozen that you can kind of just throw in your grocery cart I actually saw them, we went on a road trip I've seen them in a bunch of Walmarts mm-hmm. believe it or not like where it was like a kind of a metro style pizza that you could just, you know, grab. It was in a refrigerator. You throw it in your oven. You know what I mean? And that's kind of it. And I guess it's just it's still like a par baked crust, but like much. It's mostly less. yeah. It's it's mostly it's mostly baked. raw. No, it's mostly baked. Oh, it's mostly baked. You think? Yeah. 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 It's mostly baked, so that you can just finish it off in your oven. Yeah. Well, we went. I think we were in Arizona and we we picked up one from I believe it was Walmart but um what Huh? Oh yeah, there you go. Why are you interrupting my conversation? <laughs> um yeah, we grabbed one and it was I mean it was still like, you know, it took like I think 5 6 minutes to bake it and whatever, but like yeah, all the cheese was raw, everything was raw and it felt like they just kind of like half cooked mm-hmm. the dough. I mean I guess it would still be considered like fully cooked, like from like a bread point of view, like it was, it's edible, no, like I, it's I not would, doughy. Yeah, I would say that the the base is probably seventy, eighty percent baked. Yeah. So that yeah, it's not raw. It's not anymore. like dough by any sense of the means. It's right. just not like fully cooked dough to the point where how much you would cook it right it finishes cooking at the same time as the ingredients yeah 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 yeah. cooking but the point is to develop the the dough in such a way that it the whole thing will keep its qualities on the shelf on the shelf in the supermarket for up to three weeks yeah no it's uh it's incredible um yeah that's becoming like a you know i've been seeing i've been seeing so much of that and it's not only in pizza it's also in like you know, because they, they're trying to market like, you know, different natural, organic, non-preservative uh, like 
whether it's a spread or whether it's some kind of like uh, a carpaccio or you know what I mean? There's all kinds of products that mm-hmm. you see like lined up in this like kind of ready fresh um, display cases that are in these places. So how did so uh, what do you, what do you, would you? Oh, by the way, when I when yeah. I when Luigi Benetti came to this country to to visit because we had a customer to work on together, I took him to Antico in Atlanta. Yeah, he said. La prima volta in America. <laughs> <laughs> the first time he had had what he considered to be real pizza. Right. And then the, the other guy who was a, a, from a, a manufacturer of dough mixers I took to uh, Antico, he said, it's really hard to find pizza this good in Italy. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it, Italy, I mean, Italy's like anywhere else, bro. I mean, even Naples, like, it's... Uh, you know, you got to know where to go. Yeah. Like if you if you get off the tarmac in New York and you've never been in New York in your life and you didn't read a guide and you didn't go on Google, like which is now an option that used to not be an option not that long ago. Um, it wasn't like a pocket option, um, you know, and you just, you know, get to your hotel in Times Square or wherever and just randomly walk around and be like, oh, that's a pizzeria in New York. You're probably you can get lucky, but you're probably not going to get good pizza. Chances are, right. and it's no different in Napoli, and it's uh, no different in Italy. Like overall, you know what I mean? Like there's a there's there's I've seen tons of pizzerias in Naples that they're not using, you know, even fresh mozzarella. They're using like almost you know there. It's a different product, but it's basically like their version of a low moisture mozzarella cheese that. You know, sometimes it's going in a wood oven, sometimes it's going in an electric oven. You see, uh, the last time I was in France, I saw it everywhere. You know what I mean? It was just like, you know, it was almost like it looked like a New York pizza, but just like from like an ingredient standpoint, um, but just cooked in a higher temperature oven, whether it was electric or wood. And not really at like 900. They were generally like cooking like somewhere between like 650 and 700, which gives you like um like a much more sturdier crispier crust than you know a pie cooked at like eight or nine hundred like a you know stg neapolitan pizza would be where it's you know kind of wet on the bottom and this and that and that's all just a result of the cook time and i think um you know i mean the one guy like i don't think i don't uh, i don't think yeah dan Dan Richard does not cook. I'm I'm pretty 95% sure. If I got this wrong, Dan, I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure I'm representing you the right way. Yeah, he cooks at I believe around 700, which is a good temp. Well, yeah, he makes he makes no attempt to nor does he say he's making a Neapolitan pizza. He's making his own style, really. He, yeah, it's kind I of a, a mixed style. I'm I'm starting to think like I've been doing like a lot of like history on this stuff. I've been doing a lot of reading a lot of history about um Italy in general and uh Italian food history and just really digging in. And it's you know, I mean, my parents are both Italian. Um, you know, my grandparents are all from Italy. I could, I could tell. Yeah. <laughs> um but uh yeah, I mean, it's it turns out, like, in this research that, like, what it seems like is, like, a lot of these things that we consider traditional or things that you would think have been around, like, since time immemorial or these arguments that people get into, like, over, you know, oh, well, you know, uh, spaghetti with meatballs and chicken parmesan isn't real Italian. And it's, like, okay, but, like, you, you, you know, like, like Ribolita, if you think that Ribolita has been around for 300 years as a standardized recipe, you're wrong. It hasn't. Like what people have to understand about Italy and the food ways, like, of course, you have tons of different regions that up until not that long ago spoke like completely different yeah, languages different almost. Countries. Yeah, <laughs> they were they were different countries. Exactly. Um, but everybody kind of understands that. I think what people don't understand is that. um from the fall of the Roman Empire and really like during the Roman Empire in a lot of ways, but definitely from the fall of the Roman Empire um, all the way up to, I mean, really, I would put it at post-World War II. I mean, you could make an argument for 
you know, 1920, you're the entire country is living under, you know, feudalism. Mm-hmm. You know what yeah. I mean? Absolutely. Where ninety five percent of the population <laughs> is subsistence living. So you got like a point zero one percent aristocracy in the population. You got the people that work for them, right? Where like if you're the cheese maker, you're not you're 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 gonna live like a lot better than if you're not. Like so you have this class of people that works directly for the aristocracy, and then everyone else is fucked. Everyone else is like, you're not getting flour. There's no market to buy onions and tomatoes and carrots and shit. Like, that doesn't fucking exist. You you grow your own. No, 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 no. Yeah, you grow your own, but it's not yours. Right. You know what I mean? It was. It's supposed to be the deal on the table. Is it, It's called sharecropping. Right. So, and I mean, there's a big portion of this history where you don't even have sharecropping. You just have straight up peasantry. Which is like, go fuck yourself. Give me your shit. Mm -hmm. Um, Sharecropping was supposed to be a 50-50 split. All right, here's the land. You farm it. You work it. You get 50-50%. But, like, these people don't go to school. You know what I mean? They don't don't know math. They don't know any of these things. And they're, they're, you know, what the, you know, the padroni will do is 100% of the time is take advantage. And, you know, let's say the guy hoe breaks or his plow breaks, he'll give him a new one but charge him interest where at the end of the day when it's time to do the split, I mean, they're almost doing what, like, the IMF does to fucking developing countries. They're, like, they're they're saying, well, I gave you this. You didn't have the money for it, but there's interest on that. So, you know, they put them in a position where they're never paying it back, and then these guys get to just give them what you want. And guess what? Even if they they don't even really have to do that, because who the fuck are you complaining to? There's no like like court system like we have in this country today. There's no police system. Like the only person to complain to is the Petroni or his bosses, the aristocracy. And if you complain too much, what the fuck is stopping that guy from breaking all your teeth out of your head, raping your your wife and your daughter, breaking their teeth out of their head, and like who who nothing's stopping those guys from doing that? You know what I'm saying? So this this whole idea of you know these standardized recipes that have been around since time immemorial, I think, is like it's not really based in fact, and it's more based in um, there's a lot of you know, evidence and a lot of like history, like where, you know, Mussolini, who was a fascist, you know, one of the key tenets of fascism is nationalism. So two, two of these the, Mussolini's biggest goals, one of them was to standardize the language mm-hmm. and get as many people speaking the same language or just at least understanding it as humanly possible. And another one of the goals was to create a standardized food identity for Italy because you're you're trying to be a fascist which the entire premise of that is like national identity and you know um but you're you're walking into this country that's less than what 60 years old yeah unified right, right. and everybody speaking different like languages and everybody 1863 yeah the the unification and and it didn't uh you know, it didn't go that well after that. It wasn't like, it wasn't like the unification happened and everybody was like, "Oh, let's let's start speaking like Florentine fucking Italian and uh, you know adopt all like m- and make a lasagna everywhere." Like right. it doesn't happen like that. Um, anyway, I'm sorry for no, ranting. And I just no, they, and they, they, I mean, they still, you know, have their judgments of all the other regions. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah, of course, of course, but it all like. I mean, it always everywhere, and you know, I, I mean, Italian Americans do these this thing too, where like they they just say like, um, oh well, that's that's not real, you know, that's not actually Italian, because you know, my parents are Italian and they didn't do that, and I'm like, listen, buddy, like, <laughs> you know, okay, like your parents are from like some like little like one cow town in Campania or Calabria or ischia from 60 years ago like their life experience doesn't represent like the whole of an entire country just like it would be like it would be like um 
like uh, I don't know somebody somebody from uh, the South that you know uh, in in the South or in Kentucky. Um, you know, there's obviously like different um, you know you know food cultures and like things that they've been doing for a long time it would be like saying like oh well i went to america like somebody cooked you grits and said this is american and they were like well i've been to america i lived in america for three years and i never had grits and it's like it, okay yeah <laughs> doesn't mean it's not american right you know anyway i yeah. don't know i'm fucking ranting so uh yo you know what i wanted to ask you about so uh, here, let's do, uh, pull out that. Pull which, out that bacon and pastry book right there. Uh, which right, one? go down. It's, uh, over, yeah. Yeah, so this is, this is by, oh no, this is a different person, huh? Is this Wiley? Yeah. Who's Wiley? Do you know who that is? Nope. Okay, so who's the, who's the person who wrote the other one? The other one, I don't know. Michelle? Oh, Michelle Suez. So who's this? Who's Wiley? No, who's no. Michelle Suez? Michelle, he's the one that I told you was the... Um, he's the one that Chad went to. Like, how did Chad know this guy? Just because he's Chad? Yeah, because pretty much all the artisan bakers um, look to him as a, as a mentor. He started a school called the San Francisco Baking Institute. Oh, really? Um, and a lot of people went through there... Uh, is that still around? It is. I think he's kind of stepped back from it at this point. I think he's somewhat retired, but he's still a consultant. Okay. But it, it still, like, operates with other instructors yeah. as well, and, like, people go there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we don't, like, all of us in the pizza world, but, like, we don't, like, these things in Dixon Pizza, like, Tony Gimignani has a school, and there's the North American Pizza Academy, and mm -hmm. the VPN, and the APN, and, uh... You know, there's there's various other things, but it's 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 so crazy to me. I mean, I I, I think I, I kind of understand it, but it's so crazy to me like that, like, you know, what we do when you're a baker, uh, especially like a bread baker um, and a pizza maker, like so much of what we do is like the same thing. And like, yet we're 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 so unaware of each other's worlds yeah and and also part of the problem in in the u.s is that the general population doesn't understand that what's important in pizza is the dough well, not the toppings yeah <laughs> it's not about the toppings it's about the dough yeah well i would say it's also about the toppings well, but the toppings well i'll, I'll tell you i mean so it's it's very very easy you know what i mean you don't have to put like like all the mental effort in the world you just use a little common sense and a tiny bit of hard work to source like the best tomatoes or the best cheese or learn how to make your own cheese like it's none of these things are this difficult but with the dough that's where like the real alchemy is that's where the real like you know, kind of like mystery and what you got to put into it. And, you know, I jumped around as a kid. Like, and the dough is what makes the difference between it feeling like a lead weight in your stomach or oh, not. Oh, well, that's 100% <laughs> a fact. Yeah. But they, um, I'll tell you, I mean. And that pizza we just had didn't. No, it didn't at all because it's a well-fermented product. Right. But uh, when I picked up, I had no idea what a baker's percentage is. Like, up until five years ago, I've never met a pizza guy in my life up until about five years ago that knew what a baker's percentage was that knew what a pre-ferment was mm -hmm. that knew you know that was just thinking about this in any way and i mean i keep on mentioning his name chad but like 10 years ago yeah it was about 10 years ago a light went off in my head where i had been to you know 50 different pizzerias because like at a certain point i like made this decision where i was just like i'm not gonna work anywhere for more than three months i'm just not and i started making pizza when i was 12 years old but i was like in three months whether i'm working at a restaurant like cooking or i'm working as a pizza pizza guy um i can learn everything they have to offer to teach me and i can also learn everything wrong that they're doing 
within that three months and take both of those pieces of knowledge and move on to the next thing and continue mm -hmm. to learn. Um, but I kind of like, I really hit this like giant, like fucking wall where it was just like, you know, nobody knows how to explain shit. Now, meanwhile, like sometimes I would go, like I worked at Cipriani's, I worked at Vespa, I worked with like chefs where like when I would ask questions about why and why, when, why are we doing this here? They would be able to explain it to me in a, like an articulate way. You know what I mean? Like they're explaining the like the Malyard effect when we're like browning a fish, and you know what I mean? And how like different oils have smoke points, and you know things that just generally like oh, it's like okay, I get that. And you know when you put the sugar in this, it you know does this chemically, and like you know not all of these things were like a hundred percent like you know right but at least i felt like i was going somewhere where with pizza it was just like because you know what i mean <laughs> uh -huh. um and it was like and then you would have like crazy guys on the scene like shout out to chef santo bruno fucking love you brother sorry for breaking your balls but like bruno the, he was this guy that used to work for marcel amazing dude old school guy in the industry but he used to like he used to go around like doing consulting jobs telling people that like the secret to new york pizza was like putting like a cup of like sprite in it <laughs> and the dough and then he like changed it to coke and then he like changed it back to sprite like shit like that like that was like what would go on and everybody was fucking every i mean to, still to this day in a big part of the old school community which like any old school guy that comes up to me that like because now with social media it's a lot you know you know, we're a lot more connected, a lot more people see what other people are doing. Any of these old school people are like, how do I do that? I will literally teach them for free. I will literally teach them bakers, like whatever, whatever. But, you know, like growing up, everybody had the best pizza. Like, and it was just, I have the best pizza. And it's like, by what metric? <laughs> but, like, what are you basing this on? <laughs> like, that's a bold fucking statement. Cause like, the way I bro, I've I've done a lot of great things with pizza, whatever. I don't think I have the best pizza, and I constantly beat myself up every single time I make a pizza to this day. And I think it's always gonna be like that. Oh, I, I totally understand that. Just yeah. from, from home baking, you know, sourdough bread, I'm never satisfied with no, it. No, you can't you know? the day that you're like completely satisfied, the day that you think you won. You just lost the fucking whole fucking game, yeah. in my opinion. Like, because there's nowhere to go from there. Right. But, like, it's more than that. It's just, like, I mean, you got to have, like, so to, to even get close to being, like, the quote-unquote best thing. Because it's objective and it can never be attained. But to even get close to there, to on the level, I mean, you have to have, like, some sort of humility to even like be able to get close to there if you walk around all day thinking like your shit don't stink how do you even grow how do you like have the discipline and how do you have like the the, the literal psychosis to like wake up every day and be like all right i'm gonna try to use 32 percent wild these starter culture instead of 28 and i'm gonna up my salt by 0.2 grams and i'm gonna you know, go through all this shit to like, you know, get different results and get different textures and blah, 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 blah. But yeah, I, I, you know, I picked up Tartine bread 10 years ago and I, you know, learned all this stuff and I kind of applied it to the pizza trade. Like I didn't even learn how to make sourdough bread at that point. I just read the book, learned baker's percentages, learned pre-ferments and just said, all right, now I'm the See, I, I converted what I had been doing since I was 12 years old into those numbers, added the pre-ferment, and I, you know, the sweeped all the competitions. The, the, the fascinating thing to me also, though, is that while so much of that, uh, you know, I, I, was, I just said that, you know, it's about the dough, um, and a lot of the principles are the same, I remember the first time I walked into Moza. Uh, and and had Nancy's pizza. Yeah. It was really, really good, but it was just a bit too much like her bread. Right. It wasn't quite like 
what I wanted a pizza to be. I, I've 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 had that experience with like people that like I really respect and, that yeah, like they're I mean, she's chefs amazing and they make and, bread, bread yeah. but then yeah. they're like try my pizza and I'm like I mean it's good it's but good. like I'm not right like this isn't like a light this is like when it I have a good it wasn't pizza, my platonic ideal of pizza yeah, right? when I have a good pizza yeah. like I lose my fucking mind yeah. like I'm like yo. What the fuck? Yeah. This is fucking awesome. Like, That's the way I, I feel about dance pizza. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. Is. Dance pizza is definitely in this category. I got a buddy of mine, Dave, um, in Jersey that I met pretty recently. Um, I was hanging out with some some kid who was like, you know, follows me. He was a fan. He ended up getting like or I, I was actually at a buddy of mine's and like the guy saw me on Instagram and like ran over to where we were. And um, anyway, he introduced me to this other. He's like, "Oh, I want to. You know, I'll drive you over to my boy Dave's. Try his pizza." And first, we went to his place. He had me try his. And he's like, "Oh, what do you think?" And I was like, "Yeah, it's it's good. It's good. Solid slice. Solid slice. You know, it's you know, it's good pie." Um, you know, it wasn't. You know, I was just like, "Yeah, I'm just trying to be nice." Like, it wasn't bad yeah. by any means, but it was just like. You know, it's very run of the mill. Like, there's nothing like special about it at all. He takes me over to this kid Dave's place, and this kid's in like, you know, like near Rutherford, New Jersey, which I uh-huh. like never been to in my life. And uh-huh. it was different town. It's like some like square mile town, but like right. No, I know where it is. I know exactly. Yeah, it's, right it's like Wallington. Center. Wallington. Well, it's, it's near the sports center. So yeah, I guess yeah. I think it was called Wallington, the town. Okay. But he's got this hole in the wall. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, the place is tiny. It's falling apart. You know, he moved in there. I think it was already a pizzeria, you know, for 30 years and just took it over. Bro, one of the best squares I've ever had in my life. I was, I was drooling over it, and I'm, like, bugging out. I'm like, yo. And he, he's bugging out because he knew who I was, and he was just like, really? You think it's good? And I was like, yeah, this is amazing. But, like, when you run into those places, I'll tell you, just like in bread, more and more of those spots are popping up. Yeah, and that's why, you know, I've been telling people in industry that, in my opinion, pizza, in terms of the potential for industry, you know, when when the artisan bread movement happened, started in in the eighties, and by the late eighties and early nineties, it was starting to, they were starting to pop up artisan bakeries making really good artisan sourdough loaves in certain places around the country, and over the next you know couple of decades, it spread. And now, although it's not exactly artisan quality, you know, people will go into a Wendy's and order something on a ciabatta, you know. Right. I mean, it, it just, the industrialization and, and dispersion of the concepts of bread, what bread was, it's gone through such a huge change over the last 30 years in this country. I mean, it really was just, you know, Wonder Bread when I was growing up. Yeah. And and now people have an awareness of what bread can be that's completely a different thing from that. In my opinion, the pizza industry is today where um, artisan bread was in 1990. Right. And it's ready to explode into people starting to understand around the country over the next couple of decades what pizza really is. No, I, I 100% agree with that. I think, I think you're right. I think they're is a lot of room like even in the industrial scale to like you know just commit yourself commit like a company like with tunnel ovens but yeah commit using a com- wild com- start commit a to making a really good product and not compromising product. it just yeah. because you're making a lot of it right i mean that's been my career i mean that that has been my career that that i i built you know the la brea bakery and eventually those companies get bought by big companies and the big companies start focusing just on how many cases they can get out the door and not on maintaining the quality, and it goes down. Right. And that opens up an opportunity for some other company to fill the gap and push the quality envelope again. So sure. that was followed by Tribeca Oven. And I built a 6,000-pound-an-hour line for Tribeca Oven and then a 9,000-pound-an-hour 
line for Tribeca oven. And then they were bought by somebody, and then they were bought by somebody, and now it's the same thing. Is Now they're saying, well, why do we have to do this, and why do we have to do this? Well, you have to do this because you want to maintain your quality, but they don't care about their quality. They well, already have a market. Because in you those know? corporate in the in corporate environments that, that are buying these things, yeah. the the valuable person isn't the creative person. The valuable person is the guy who's crunching the numbers, who's on the Excel sheet, who's figuring out yeah. because we live in we live in an economy right now of it, it's like an unlimited growth. Like a company is uh, especially like a, a publicly traded company yeah. or a very big company is not considered successful. You can the company can make 10 billion. Yeah. But if yeah. they make 8 billion the following year, they're considered it's, un, it's, it's right. considered a failure, right. which is fucking insane because you made eight billion dollars yeah no it, it is but point point being that you're constantly opening up opportunities for people who do want to push the envelope on quality um and but then how so, is it ever going to get to like a place where it becomes well, like what the happens, standard or everywhere what, because you constantly like you might fall in love with um you know tribeca you know, whatever it was five years ago and be like, oh, I can't believe I could walk in a supermarket and like get a product that I could trust. Mm -hmm. And then like, bro, you're not following the, 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 the sales or the company of Tribeca, like on, on the stock market or in business news to know that they got bought by fucking wonder bread or whoever, the, like giant conglomerate bought right, them. But what, what happens is that a better product shows up and you have started to get a little bit disillusioned with this product, and you try that product, and it's better, and so you switch to that product. Maybe in another but then, But then Tribeca is okay with that because they have now – they can now sell that product to a level that never bought that product before. Right. So that's why, you know, okay. It might take the a Chibata, 20% the, loss, the, but it's still better the, than the run the, the Chibata at Wendy's isn't a real Chibata. But it's a hell of a lot better than what Wendy's used to sell, right? Sure. So you're constantly actually uplifting the general level, even if that general level is still not at the level that freaks like us, you know, want. Right, right, right. And meanwhile, there are other people who are, who, are, who are pushing that level further and further. Yeah. Yeah, and it does, uh, it does you know, you're constantly opening up room. I've been having a, like... Because the, con the consciousness of what bread is has changed in my lifetime oh yeah it country. definitely has it's, and that and that will happen with pizza well it's happening it's, with pizza it's almost become on like i mean obviously like you know i live on the i mean i think this is everywhere though everywhere i go where like people like have this general understanding from all walks in life and all socioeconomic classes that like bread's bad for you yeah. Right? right, and they're not a hundred percent wrong because most bread Some, products, yeah, most bread is are just... really like, yeah, it's it's got a much higher glycemic. It's going to cause um, blood sugar spikes. It's going to cause insulin uh, level spikes. Well, it's not only that; it's that you know you can't digest it. Yeah, and you can't <laughs> digest it. But I mean, that's the whole reason. And that's why people think they're allergic to gluten. They're not allergic to gluten. They're no. allergic. They're allergic to modern wheat, and they're allergic to a process that makes bread with um, commercial yeast that doesn't, you know, digest it properly, and just is all about blowing it up, but isn't about. Yeah. You know. Well, what they do is they, you know, they're taking, you know, really high concentrations of commercial yeast. They're, you know, in a, you know, industrial like Wonder Bread type of factory. They're rising their product in like under two to three hours. You know what I mean? Which is fucking crazy you know so D did you um have you watched the uh i think it's i can't remember if it's Net netflix or amazon did a four-part series from michael pollan's book um cooked where oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and the the one on on bread is really really yeah he's the first first episode i yeah. believe is the bread one like, uh, maybe well, it's the one on air Huh? It's the one. Yeah, on it's air. the one on air. It's on, yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. that's the first. It might have been the second or third. Yeah, one. you know what it was? It was probably that's the one I watched first because uh -huh. I, I was probably sure. going through the descriptions. I was like, Brad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. But, but uh, you know, he he talks about the the uh, the evolution of how commercial yeast caught on with bakers and you know how it's destroyed um, the quality. Well, 
Yeah, it's um, you know, I mentioned it before. My boy, um, um, my boy Domenico, that I said his father has, you know, a wholesale baking operation with a old school tunnel oven in Long Island. Um, you know, up until the 1990s, um, you know, and they he had been a baker, you know, from Italy originally. You know, came over here when he was probably like 20, 25 years old and, you know, had been baking bread since, you know, in America since like the 60s or 70s. And up until the 90s, they always used like pre-ferments and, you know, bigas and this and that. Mm-hmm. And then what happened was is there was this major like paradigm shift in what people were looking for in a quality of bread. And what people, people wanted this softer, like no crust, spongy bread. And cause you know, that's what I wanted when I was a child, his son, well, yeah, (laughs) but it became like a thing where like, you know, uh, a tasty sub shop or, or John's deli, or, you know, that's what they were looking for. And that's what they were looking for at the grocery stores. And it, it was like insane to hear him say this because, you know, I was very young, but I kind of, you know, I lived through it and I kind of like remember, you know what I'm saying? Like certain, you know, aspects of that where he was just like, you know, we, we couldn't sell, you know, this old, this product that we were making before. And, and, you know, to us, you know, to them, they're, they're just, they weren't doing pre-ferments because, you know, they were fucking into it and they were trying to get people a healthy product or everybody. They were doing it because that's how they always did it and that's how they learned to do it. Right. And it was like they, you know, it was like, well, well, this is the texture of bread we want. You know what I mean? And it's like, okay, we'll just, you know, throw a bunch of yeast and oil and a bunch more sugar, you know what I mean, to keep the from spongier and then you add... Don't, I don't conditioners. And yeah, I mean, I, bro, don't... I I don't know. I gotta I gotta get somebody on the podcast to explain those to me, bro. Dough conditioners in the bread world is like, bro. What what's that company called that was sponsoring the bread symposium? Oh, Pirados. Bro, what the fuck is that shit? Like they're like, they look like a multi billion dollar company. They're no, very, yeah, they're huge. Yeah. Uh, but the, that's what they do, right? They just make yeah. But what, what's so strange is these companies—they're like the oil companies. Like they'll—they'll they'll be you know oil companies, but they'll be advertising how they're all about green energy. Oh know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as the same oh, thing. Like oh. Piratos has has a a sourdough culture library. Yes, I know. You know I mean, what? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 ridiculous. But I mean, that's 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 uh you know. That's corporate culture today. Yeah. All around. It's like it's like um, you know, you got your uh you know, products being built and manufactured in essentially fucking slave labor camps. Essentially, like not chattel slavery, but it's like, you know, you look at a Foxconn factory, it's you know, people are jumping off the roofs every day because, you know, it's just it, it's bad. Um But meanwhile, you know, you're like, you know, promoting, you know what I mean? Or you're doing like this thing, like, you know what I'm saying? Like trying to, you know, oh, we're doing the right thing on here and we believe in this. So we believe in that issue. And, you know, we support yada yada. And it's just like, really? Like, you guys are fucking horrible. Like, you know? Yeah. But I mean, that's the world. That's the world we live in. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's a crazy thing. Anyway. I think, what time are we on? We're over time, right? We are. Okay. We're going to wrap this up. But Stephen Bloom, Allied Bakery, Bakery equipment. equipment. Yeah. I just said that right. I yeah. said it with you. We said it together. Yeah. Yo, everybody, thank you so much for joining in. Stephen, you are the man. I really, really appreciate this. This it's, was a it's lot a of huge, fun. It's a huge honor I'm to exhausted, have you on. I'm exhausted, but it's a lot of no, fun. No, I know. I know. <laughs> I'm like, I'm getting there too, bro. But I got some good pizza out of it. Yeah, we got some good pizza out of it. All right, we'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, you told me we would be talking for two, three hours and almost four. I didn't, believe, I didn't believe you. Great.